You are watching Co-op for Two, broadcasting live from Champaign, Illinois on February 19th, 2021 at around 11.30 p.m. My name is Jesse Reichler. Greg has the night off. So today we are going to play the second case from the Sherlock Holmes Baker Street Irregulars box, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. And I should say a little bit about why we're playing this and how this fits into the larger picture. Over the last few weeks, if you've been following along, we've been sort of sampling from these different detective games. We, and especially games related to the Sherlock Holmes consulting detective system, which is from the 80s. So we played Ellery Queen, a, a sort of bootleg, lesser known game. We played Mythos Tales last week. And then a couple weeks ago, we played case one from this box, this box right here. So um, here's one of the, the first, the first box, second box, third box. Um, and the Baker Street Irregulars is from 1920, I think, the, the last box. So we played the first case and we loved it. I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. And Dave Neal, who's the author of all of the cases, I think, in this box. Did an amazing job, gave me exactly, it was like a return to form. It was, it was, a, it was a great experience. So we've almost gone through all of these Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective derived games with one notable uh, exception, which is Gumshoe, which is here. This is the 1986, very, very ambitious, out of print, no one has played it, um, a spin-off set in the 1930s. Now, the only reason we're not playing that is because we're saving that for Greg. So hopefully we can get Greg to come and do one of these live streams with us and play through that. And those cases are all connected. It's very, very convoluted, very ambitious, and sort of half works from what I understand. So, having said that, what we're doing now is sort of changing pace. I think what we're going to do now is, instead of doing this broad tour of these games, we've picked one. Patreon supporters have picked this one. All of you, all of you got together, you voted, you hashed it out, and you decided that we should play um, this box. And so we're going to play all 10 cases in that box over the next 10 weeks or so. That's... That's the plan. I can't promise we're going to keep doing that, but that is the plan. So we're going to dive deep into this box. And we're going to start today with case two. And if case two is anything like case one, you know, I can't wait. So let's check in. This is a good time to check in with the comments. See, make sure that the, um, the sound is coming through okay. If the people in the comments could let me know. And then we'll take a look at what we've got. Now, those of you who have been watching the channel know that the sound check, all right, so it looks like everything's good. So if you've been watching the channel, there aren't that many of you, but you know the sort of premise here is sort of, you could put this on the background. You don't have to be here the whole time. We're gonna do the whole case. Nothing's edited out. Could take four hours. We'll read the whole newspaper. I mean, this is, this. first of all, this is full of spoilers. So if you think you're going to want to play this game, just turn off, turn off the channel. You can come back and watch it after you play it yourself. But I'd like to invite you to come play it with me. So this would be a good chance. Get your pen and paper to take notes. This is a game where you do have to take notes. If you've got this at home, you can open up the map and play along. I'll give... I won't do this every time we play, since I did go over this once, so I'm not gonna open up the whole box, but I'll go over briefly the rules and the way the game works. We probably, if we play 10 of these cases, we won't do that every time. But just to remind you, we play this in a very relaxed way. I'm not gonna try to solve this as quickly as possible. I'm not gonna try to get the highest score, which we'll talk about in a second, but we're gonna play it for the en enjoyment of the atmosphere of the 1800s Victorian England. 
So we're here for the story and the atmosphere, the feels of talking to people. We want to talk to these people, these characters from the 1800s, which is what I love about this game. I love hearing these people talk and learning a little bit about life in the 1800s. And maybe that a good place to start is the name of this case, The Mudlark Mystery. Let's go to our countdown camera here. The Mudlark Mystery. So if you don't know this game, if, if this is the first time you're watching this, there's actually 10 cases in this box. Each case has its own little booklet. It has an introductory story and then chap a little paragraphs that you read when you go to a place and investigate a clue. Now, we were just talking about learning stuff. The last time we played Sherlock Holmes, last time we played this box, we learned about what a gunpowder magazine is. We learned about a whole bunch of stuff. Now, does everyone know what a mudlark is? Do you know what a mudlark is? Mudlark is someone who scavenges around in the mud for things that people have lost. Maybe some money that someone dropped into the river from a boat or some jewelry, etc. I guess it's like the bird. There's a bird that scavenges in mud for things. So that's the name of this case. Okay, so let's just remind ourselves how to play while you guys get your coffee and your notes and your paper. Um, we've got a map of London. We are the Baker Street Irregulars, which were little kids that helped Sherlock Holmes. And the, the, the sort of premise of these cases is that Sherlock Holmes is too busy for this case, these cases. So we're, we're doing the work along with Watson. So we've got the map of London. We've got a directory, which is absolutely essential. And it's organized alphabetically in the front. So you can look up people by their name or stores by their name, etc. And then the back has uh, organized by category. So auction houses, banks, barristers, baths, boarding houses, booksellers, etc. Et so if you hear someone's at a certain place, you might look up that hotel, find out where its location is on the map. And the whole structure of the game is you pursue leads by picking a location, looking up its number. So if you pick the location in the Northwest neighborhood of London, say 40 Northwest, we would turn to Northwest 40. We would see, we would read the paragraph if there's one there, and that might give us additional leads. In addition to the directory of all the places in London, we've got a bunch of people, informants, that are always available. And these are sort of notable people that uh, Sherlock Holmes knows. So you can check out, you can visit Scotland Yard, you can talk to the reporter for the newspaper, National Archives, a criminologist, the owner of a pub, Raven and Rat, who he sort of knows underworld people, uh, another social columnist newspaper, medical examiner, librarian. You can talk to Sherlock Holmes himself if you go visit him uh, at 42 Northwest. That's typically a sort of uh, hint mechanism. If you get lost, you can go there, or sometimes the story will direct you to him. And you can check out the central carriage stables if someone took a taxi, etc. So these are all places, they all have their own specific location, and you would just look those up as normal. There is no actual position of us on this map, we just pick any place we want to go to and go to it. We don't have to travel, it doesn't take time to travel. In general in this game, there's no time limit. You keep track of how many turns and how many leads you followed and that will affect your score. If you were trying to get a good score, you'd want to try to solve it as quickly as possible. We don't want that, we want to take our time. And then there's also a very important mechanic to this game, which are these newspapers. So there's a newspaper for each case, um, except for the last, sorry, the last five cases are connected. And so those newspapers all, you might have to be searching five newspapers for, for information. But the first five cases, they each have their own newspaper. So you can see November 19th, and this is our case, 
to June. That's not right. I think we've got the wrong newspaper here. Okay. We'll have to get out the... This is what happens when you do it live. So you get a chance to see the box. So we need the newspaper near our case, which is Friday, June 17th. So it's this newspaper. This one was for our first case. I guess we could have, we would have noticed that. We would have recognized that newspaper. And while we're up moving about, I'll just go and get our markers here. So we're going to use these markers to keep track of weeds that we discover. And okay, so where were we? Newspaper. So we're going to have to read this newspaper carefully, which is not the most entertaining thing to do on camera. And I think we'll do what we did last time. We'll wait until we read the introduction to the case and then we'll read through it. If I was doing this alone, I might read through it twice once before the introduction and once after. But we will also have to remember to come back to this because this is one of the, this is one of the most wonderful parts about this game that, that Sherlock Holmes, if you look at all of these detective games, including the modern ones, Detective City of Angels and Chronicles of Crime, they all to some degree or another make use of the mechanic of hiding information in a large block of text, which is similar if you were reading a novel, if you were reading a detective story, you know, you've got to hunt and find clues in the text. But no game does it as much as the Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective series. And this newspaper is a good example. It's, you know, a large, a large bunch of text that's got little nuggets in there that you have to find. So we will read this out loud together. Um, and I want you guys to help me because my memory is not that great. So you help me. Last case we played of this, we missed something in the newspaper that was important for our case. So we may have to, we'll probably have to come through it a couple times, but we'll get to this after we read our introduction, which I think we're ready to do right now. I've got my paper for notes. I've got my pipe to help me think, which is a good reminder to me to tell you, for those of you who have been watching, the answer to previous uh, episodes quiz is cold, cold weather. Okay, so case two. We don't need the rules, we'll just push, push those aside. All right, case two. Let's see if I can give you a better view of this. There you go, case two. All right, let's read this together. Case two. Friday, June 17th, 1887. The Mudlark Mystery. It is a Friday morning and we are gathered at the abandoned warehouse, which is home to most of the Baker Street Irregulars. Wiggins has just told a very rude story about the Duchess of Cornwall, and we are all in fits of laughter when Tinker comes running in looking very excited. We need to go see Mr. Holmes, he shouts. What for, Tinker? asks Simpson between giggles. Tinker reaches into his pocket and pulls out a battered red tin that says Poddington's Oatcakes on it. We look at him with blank expressions on our faces. Why would Mr. Holmes be interested in oatcakes? asks Wiggins. Wiggs, they ain't oatcakes in here, replies Tinker. This morning, me and my fellow mudlark Shifty we're searching for anything valuable washed up on the bank of the th Thames. And I found this tin. He slowly opens the tin and we see some gray white stuff inside. It's full of salt, he continues. But in the salt, he reaches in carefully, is this. Tinker draws his hand out of the tin and we gasp in surprise. <gasps> he is holding a human finger. A short time later, at Baker Street, Watson is studying the finger using one of Holmes' magnifying glasses. Where is Mr. Holmes? says Tinker. He went to Manchester yesterday, replies Watson. 
to investigate the disappearance of Lord Darrington's son. He said he would travel back today, so I expect he will be here soon. Well, with the good doctor's medical knowledge, I'm sure he can tell us as much about his, this finger as Mr. Holmes could, says Simpson. Watson smiles. I imagine not quite as much as Holmes, he says. Still, I can tell you it has been roughly cut, so I doubt it was done by a medical professional. It is a left index finger, large and muscular, probably a man's, and appears to have been removed post-mortem. And the only thing I can see of note is the tattoo along the finger's right side near the knuckle joint. We all nod, having already noticed the small black shapes marked on the skin. Zeta, Omega, a couple of Greek symbols. Is it writing? asks Wiggins. It could be Greek characters, replies Watson, but I cannot read Greek, I'm afraid. Tinker, says Wiggins, did you and your friend find anything else near where this tin was? Yes, Wiggs. There was a tatty leather satchel. Shifty has it. He lives at the boarding house at 56 Lollard Street. And where exactly did you find it? Tinker thinks for a moment. Just to the south of Westminster Bridge on the eastern side of the river. Well, lads, says Wiggins, I can think of nothing better to do with my Friday afternoon than try to solve the mystery of this detached finger. Shall we begin? After nodding our assent, we all head outside. Okay. Felt like that was a little smoother, than, a little easier than our last one. Let's put stuff out that we know about. So what did we use last time? We used these pink ones. I think I'm using the same ones. We use these metal cubes from Board Game Geek, which for for almost every game we play to keep track of stuff. All right, so um, first he told us where Shifty lives. Shifty has the satchel, right? He lives at 56 Lollard Street. So 56 Lollard Street is interesting because I don't know where Lollard Street is, and I'm not sure we can look that up so simply. Um, and we can't look shifty up. He's not gonna. This little kid's not gonna be in the directory, and we don't have his last name. So we're gonna put. We're gonna. We're gonna keep good notes. I hope you're keeping. This is your chance. Last time you didn't, but now you're gonna keep good notes with me. So let's let's put our leads here. Let's see. I'll kick this board around a little bit. So 56 Lollard Street is shifty okay we've got i'm just putting random clues here and we've got the greek letters on tattoo right we also know what we know it's a um right index finger probably muscular man probably right we got some other information as well it was roughly cut, right? Not a medical person didn't cut it. It was in a tin of oat cakes, potting tins, oat cakes. Okay, so he says they were on the bank of the Thames, of the Thames, Thames, bank of the Thames River. Um, and he says a little bit more later. They ask him, where exactly did you find it? And he says, south of Westminster Bridge. On the eastern side of river. Okay, so some of you may know where this... Well, here's the Thames. It's this big, giant river. Okay. Let's look for Westminster Bridge. Here's Westminster Bridge. He says, what does he say? South of Westminster Bridge on the east of the river. So that would be somewhere in here. 
south of the bridge, east of the river. All right, so we've got a location here. St. Thomas Hospital, that's not a bad starting point for us, but we gotta find out where this kid lives, right? So I'm gonna start a new page here for leads. One is gonna be 29 Southwest. All the clues are number and then neighborhood. So 29 Southwest is sort of near where finger found, right? And now we've got a question mark, which is the 56 Lollard Street. Well, let's see if Shifty might live around there, right? So let's see if you see any Lollard Street. I know you guys can't see this well enough. 56 Lower Street. We're not looking for the number, I don't think, although it wouldn't kill us to look at 56. Okay, so it is. It was a nice clue. Normally, these numbers don't have to... Well, maybe they do. Anyway, 56 Lower Street. There it is. Okay. So, we know where Shifty lives, which is also in Southwest near... Not surprising that he lives near the river. Were there any other clues here that, well, okay, so another clue might be someone who knows Greek or the library, you know, someone educated enough that might know something about these symbols. All right, do you guys have a preference for which of these leads we want to track down first. I'm not going to I'm not going to spend the whole time going back and forth in the comments, but if you've got something to say otherwise, I'll just go on my own. All right. We're not going to start digging around in the river yet, although if you were a detective, you would be a little bit worried about that stuff washing away. Maybe we are worried. But this is also the hospital. And I want to go talk to the people at the hospital till we get that leather thing. So let's go to Lowered Street, visit Shifty before he's killed by someone. And, oh, newspaper. Newspaper. We almost forgot the newspaper. Did you guys say anything about the newspaper? Hmm. Okay. All right. No, let's read the newspaper. I'm going to remove these for now. We'll remember to put them back. All right, so now we're going to have to read the news. This is normally when I take a break, but normally these introductions, these introductory stuff takes like an hour and a half to tell you about the box and the game. Since we've only done a half hour, we're not going to take a break. We're going to jump right in. Shall I give you a, would you like a top down, nice view of close up? Let's do it. All right, let's read this paper together. Friday, June 17th. Okay, so we've got some births, birth announcements. I'll try not to get my hand in the way too much. We've got some birth announcements. Those probably not relevant to us, right? Maybe we just glance over those. It's just three people born. Let's skip that. There's a marriage on the 15th. Campbell Church, Queens Park. Uh, Reverend D. Parker married these two people, Bottle and Niles. Okay. Someone died here on the 14th, three days ago, at home at 79th Falmouth Road Southeast, which is not really near, near our area. Um, someone died at home, Sarah Elizabeth Blake, wife of Abel Arthur Blake, age 29. Okay. Here's some personals, job horses, Mr. and Mrs. Milton, Cherry House, 67 Piccadilly, Northwest Supply, Superior, High Stepping Pairs and Single Horses of Quality by the month or by the year. Okay, so you can rent a horse. Bookkeeping, writing, commercial correspondence, tuition by a practical man, a chartered accountant and specialist, appointments secured, prospectus post five, business and training college, 74 High Holborn, oh, post free. Um, prospectus post free. Okay. 
Each Sunday at premises on Vauxhall Bridge Road, a social gathering of inventors and artists. Regular visitors include Mr. and Mrs. J. Fru, Mr. R. Jago, and Mr. and Mrs. D. Rolf. Expressions of interest to Mr. R. Harris, CEO of the Times office. Now this one looks interesting. The Greek language, rapidly acquired by application of a highly successful method of tuition. Apply, personally or in writing, to Miss Yabel, Yabilly, 23 Gota Street, Southeast. Okay, so that one we're definitely going to write down, right? There's our, there's our Greek expert. 23 Gota Southeast. 23 Southeast Gota. This is going to be our Greek expert. Okay, that's exciting. Let's go back. Dr. Whitebread of 12 Oxford Street respectfully invites the attention of connoisseurs to his unrivaled collection of china teacups, over 350 specimens of all the most notable fabrics. Okay, so it's just a guy putting in a personal, saying, hey, I got some great teacups, come over to my house and check them out. All right, let's continue here. Miscellaneous. The Stanbridge Foundation for the Care of London Cemeteries invites new members with an express desire to maintain the city's great funeral monuments in a respectful and dignified condition to apply in person at 82 South Wark Bridge Road. Okay. Pet Dog Show. The Pug Dog Club and Toy Spaniel Club's third annual show and great show of all varieties of pet dogs. This day, last day... Open from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Parade of prize winners at 4.30 at the Olympia. Todd and Son Butchers, the finest cuts in London, 4 Longford Street, Northwest. You let me know in the comments if it's useful for you to have this close zoomed in view of the newspaper. I, I guess it depends on how you're, whether you're reading this on a phone or... All right, let's continue. Entertainments and see, whatever that means, and see. Sarast will play Mendelssohn's Violin Concerto in E minor at his second concert on Saturday afternoon next at St. James Hall. The Egyptian Hall. Mr. and Mrs. Staffer present England's Home of Mystery, 17th consecutive year in London, the most wonderful, amusing, and original entertainment in the world. Inimitable, consequently unique. Daily at 3 and 8, prices 5 at 5 cent, 3 cent, 2 cent. Balcony, one cent. Children and schools, half price. Balcony accepted. Royal Amateur Orchestral Society. Patrons, Her Majesty the Queen, HRH the Prince of Wales, KG President, HRH the Duke of Edinburgh, KG. The fourth and last smoking concert at Prince's Hall, Piccadilly the date of which has been fixed by HRH, the Prince of Wales, will take place on Saturday, 18th July at 9 p.m. Vocalists, Mr. N. Newark and Mr. Avon D. Saxon. A limited number of tickets will be issued and may be obtained through members of the Society of Mr. G. Bainbridge, Clarence House, Mr. Thurley, Marlboro Club, and J.R.D. Honorary Secretary. There's a little note here. The Times may be purchased in Paris at 8 Rue des Chapelsines, in Brussels at 46 Rue des Madeleines, and in Rome at the Plaza di Spagna. Okay, column two. Take a breath here. All right, you guys, it's kind of overwhelming to have all of this text read to you, I know. But we've got to do it if we plan to solve this mystery. Vandalism and property damage. At Holborn on Thursday, Mr. Jack Whitaker, a veterinarian, gave evidence in a case in which Mr. Ernest Tafson, a draper who lives at the west end of Bloomsbury Way, was summoned for causing willful damage to a property on that same street. Mr. Marsham was presiding. Mr. Whitaker's testimony ran thus. I was hurrying along Bloomsbury Way to attend an injured horse when I observed the prisoner projecting rocks and pieces of wood at one of the houses. As I approached, he struck home with one of his missiles and shattered a window entirely. 
This portion of success only seemed to expand his rage, and he continued to hurl the objects at an increasing pace. The case against the prisoner was proved, but the defendant submitted that he had just cause to lay assault to his neighbor's property, claiming that the lady of the house had insulted him, and that her husband had made inappropriate comments to Mr. Tafson's, da Tafson's daughter. Mr. Marsham responded that even if such events had occurred, they were not justification for the criminal damage of property and imperiling the safety of his neighbors on Bloomsbury Way. The defendant was fined £3.10 with £1.20 costs. So legal fees have gone up a bit since then. Princess Christian at Kenseltown. Yesterday afternoon, Princess Christian paid a visit to Kenseltown for the purpose of laying a foundation stone dedicated to St. Thomas to be erected on a site at the corner of East Row and Kensal Road. A greater portion of the route followed by the princess was decorated with bunting and lined with people who gave Her Royal Highness an enthusiastic reception. The princess duly laid the stone and then received purses of money in aid of the building fund. The amount in the purses presented was £98 and the amount of the collection £149, making a total of £247. Charge of murder. Yesterday at the Old Bailey Criminal Court, David Hills, barman, originally of Newcastle upon Tyne, was charged with murdering Louisa Marina Hughes, a barmaid of London, and also with bigamously marrying her. Big bigamously marrying her. Mr. C.M. Dix prosecuted on behalf of the Treasury and Mr. E. Clark defended. According to the evidence, the prisoner is, mar is a married man, the prisoner, a married man, and the deceased were employed at the Piccadilly Hotel, and they went through the form of marriage in April. After the ceremony, they purchased two revolvers. A policeman saw them together at Archbishop's Park on May 20th, and the deceased was found shot shortly afterwards. Only a half a penny was found in her possession. When the prisoner was apprehended, a letter was found on him addressed to his wife, in which he spoke of his approaching death. Mr. Clark concluded for the defense that the woman's death was due to suicide and that there was no evidence of any agreement to commit suicide upon which a charge against the prisoner could be substantiated. The bench said the prisoner would be committed for trial upon both charges. Okay, that was a little confusing to me when I was reading it. But there's a suicide murder, but they both bought guns and maybe they want she committed suicide or maybe he killed her. But we don't know if that has anything to do with our cases. Calls to the bar. The undermentioned gentlemen were yesterday called to the bar. Lincoln's Inn, Alan Napier McNabb Dally, Studentship in Jurisprudence and Roman Civil Law, CLE Trinity, 1886, of Queens College, Galway. James Austin Cartmel, M.A. Enberg, Lewis Pug Evans Pug, B.A. Oxford, and Lawrence Herman, M.A. Cambridge. These are people who graduated to the bar. Inner, at Inner Temple, we have Alfred John Bowman, B.A., Cambridge, Joseph King, M.A., Oxford, William Warwick Buckland, M.A., Cambridge, Richard Atkins Shepherd, late scholar of Trinity College, Oxford, B.A., Venerian scholar, Oxford, Walter Addington Willis, L.L.B., London, and Charles Hutton Dodsworth, Le Maistre, B.A., Dublin. Middle Temple, Joseph Henry Longford, Her Majesty's Vice Consul, Tokyo, Japan, B.A., Queen's University, Ireland, John Hay Crane, St. John's College, Oxford, Henry George Williamson, B.A., LLB, Cambridge, and Mirza Mohammed Kazim Hussein of Calcutta University. So, this is, if you don't, like, either you love this kind of stuff, that you're spending a half hour reading this newspaper that feels like the stuff you would find in a real newspaper, or you're the kind of person that's like, why? <laughs> why am I spending a half hour of my life reading a fake newspaper of stuff that has obviously nothing to do with anything? But we enjoy it for the flavor. Assault in Regent's Park. 
A young man named Colin White was set upon last night by two men while walking through Regent's Park. The injuries he sustained were sufficient to place him in hospital. Nothing was stolen, and, as yet, the motive for the attack, which was apparently unprovoked, is not known. Anyone who was witness to the attack or saw anything suspicious in Regent's Park yesterday evening is encouraged to speak to Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard. So, it might be... Um, you know, maybe in the future, before we read the newspaper, we look around the scene and look at what locations and what streets are nearby. Because clearly, like, if some of these things happened, maybe you could get some witnesses. But this finger, I mean, it's not, I it mean, it's probably not killed right away. Maybe the, the forensic person the mortuary can tell us how old the finger is. It would be useful if we're looking for a murder that's, to know if we're looking for a murder that's 20 years ago or two days ago. Okay, we're almost done. Let's go back to the newspaper and finish up here. Royal Horticultural Society Flower Show. At the flower show held on Thursday, June 16th at the Royal Horticultural Society, a most unusual specimen of South African flora was represented by the Cape Cunonia, bearing long and dense white spikes. It came from the collection of Lord Leonard Horsemeyer, Kirk's... What does that say? Kirk's Crinum. I may need my glasses for this. That guy had a long name. Or was it a pair? Okay, so I need my glasses. So Lord Leonard Horsemeyer, period. Kirk's Crinum bearing white blossoms with a pink band running down the center of each petal, was sent in by Mr. F. Ross. Miss L. Meads received a silver Banksian medal and a first-class certificate for one of the finest hybrid orchids ever raised. It is a cross between Leila Digbiana and Catala Mosai and partakes of the characters of both its parents, deriving its coloring from its material parent, maternal parent, the Cutlea, and form from the Leia. Okay, this is a part of the problem with trying to put this down for you to read it. I'm sort of a couple feet away trying to read this, and my eyes are not great as they are. Loan exhibition at London University College. A small exhibition of pictures and other works of art was yesterday opened at the Art School London University College 43 WC East Wing in the presence of many members of the university and its residents. The committee, consisting of Mr. Alexander MacDonald and Reverend John Terwitt, among others, has worked hard to form the collection with the view that the proceeds should go to the purchase of books for the university library. Among the old masters in the exhibition include specimens of Era Bartolomeo, Bartolomeo, the School of Botticelli, Kype, Roysdale, Adrian Astad, and others. Among modern masters, there are pictures by Mr. Holman Hunt, London Bridge on the Night of the Prince of the Wales Marriage, lent by Miss Combe, Mr. Britton Riviere, and Professor Herkimer. As the first exhibition of its kind to be held at the university, it is hoped it will have considerable success. You really gotta like pronouncing names to play this game. To the editor, it's kind of, it's not the best thing to do live on a YouTube channel for me, but okay, we're, we're persevering. To the editor of the Times, sir, I do not, this is, a, there's a, there's a letter to the editor in all of these newspapers, and there's, it's usually someone being curmudgeon about London. To the editor of the Times, sir, I do not see that anything further is to be gained by discussion of the situation at Gwendor. But in regarding to my mentioning the name of Mr. Patrick O'Brien MP as having been connected with the distribution of relief at Falcarag, Father Broyle, writing to your newspaper on June 14th, is obviously right. The honorable member for Tipperary was never in Donegal, and I regret that I should have introduced this name by mistake. Mr. Patrick O'Brien, member for North Monaghan, 
was, as he says himself, the only member of the House of Commons bearing that name in the country. Yours truly, T.W. Russell. Okay, I, I missed, I hope you guys, sometimes when I'm reading this, I'm not following it, so I'm hoping you guys can pick up what some of this is about. Some guy's writing to correct a previous letter, it seems. Okay, here's another one. Uh, to the editor of the Times, Sir, I do wish, in relation to the situation at Guidor, that your readers would cease confusing me with Mr. Patrick O'Brien, member for North Monaghan. I was the only Patrick O'Brien associated with the whole affair and present in Donegal at the time, as any consultation of the local records will reveal. And in foreign news, we have received the following through the Reuters agency. Trip in the Rapids of Niagara, Toronto, June 15th. Today, Mr. Carlisle D. Graham has made his third trip over the Niagara Falls waterfall in a barrel. Hundreds gathered to watch Mr. Graham, and there was a palpable sense of excitement as he embarked. He emerged without harm or injury to rapturous applause. On his second trip on August 8, 1886, Graham left his head outside the barrel and as a consequence sustained permanent hearing loss. French military in Greece, Athens, June 13th. The French military mission, headed by Brigade General Victor Vassoff, Vassour, need my glasses on, are preparing to leave Greece as their tenure under invitation from Prime Minister Charles Tripakolis, Tripakolis has come to an end. The Prime Minister invited the French military to assist in the training and reorganization of the Hellenic army. Miners Camp Raid, New Mexico, Santa Fe, June 14th. A large miners camp in the area of Grouse Creek has been raided by Apache Indians. Over 50 are believed killed, with those names so far being Mr. Samuel Lopez, Mr. Frank Moulton, and Mr. Tobias Lee, formerly of White's Chapel, London. Okay, well that was a long newspaper and I feel like nothing there except for our Greek expert, jumped out at me as being related. That's, we're going to have to go back to that newspaper. That was a rough one. The last newspaper was a little easier to parse. All right, so let's put these things back where I found them originally. I just removed them for this. We have the bridge was at 29, and then this kid, Shifty, was at 56. And then we've got a new clue which was the Greek expert at 23 Southeast. Looks like our case may be down in the lower right for this game. 23 Southeast. Is this southeast? If this is... It's weird because our cases here are southwest. 29 southwest, which seem to include here. And then we got a 23 southeast, which is right near some southwest. It's almost like... Unless you see another 23 southeast. Uh, it looks like southeast and southwest... Unless you think this is all southeast and then we did these wrong, like, is his house, is there another Lowered Street? 56? Oh, no, we found 56 Lowered, that's southeast. Okay, sorry. Sorry for the confusion. This is just, I was calling this southwest, but it's not. It's all southeast. So actually, Lowered Street ad address is southeast. And the bridge location is southeast. So that's sort of important. If we looked it up in the book as southwest, we wouldn't find it. So everything's in the southeast for now. All right, that was a bit of a rough start for our first hour. Let's take a little uh, five minute break. Everyone can get in stretch, get your pens and papers, point out anything you saw in the newspaper that seemed relevant that I missed. And I will see you in five minutes.
Okay, we are back. You're watching Call for Two. This will be a good time for you to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you're not already subscribed. Um, I'm actually a little <laughs> concerned about doing so many of these solo live streams because it's not really what the channel's supposed to be about. It's supposed to be um, Greg and me here and discussing board games and stuff and instead of these six hour solo sessions so if you if you don't feel like subscribing to this content that's okay you can come back watch our other discussions or watch some of our reviews and see if that's more to your tastes so we've got um three uh, only three clues to start out with. We've got Shifty and uh, the leather satchel he found. We can go check out around the area that they, uh, where they found the finger and the hospital. And then there's the Greek expert, which I'm really interested in talking to. And then, of course, we've got all of our um, informants. Like, I think a, a good place to go early. Last time, often we don't go to these Um until later in the case when we run out of leads, but I feel like this might be one of the cases where we might want to go to the coroner quite early or the hospital and see if they can tell us how long this finger, uh, when, when the person died or whatever. Um, okay, so before we get back, we're gonna do a little taste here, taste test of this Starbucks Nitro Cold Brew. It says black, sweet, and dark caramel. Okay, let's see what this tastes like. Oh, it's nitro. It's got a little nitrous oxide thing like a can of Guinness would have. Um, that's interesting. I wouldn't recommend it. I expect, I, in fact, I don't even know if it does have a nitrous oxide thing, but um, it's not sweet at all, which is normally fine for me, but it's sort of got a caramel taste like it's supposed to be sweet, but it's not, which is weird. Yeah, I would not recommend that at all. So that's an anti-advertisement for Starbucks. I actually do drink, um, in our little Kerrig, I mix, when I make coffee, I mix Columbia, Starbucks Columbia ground coffee with a decaf coconut ground coffee, half and half. So that's the coffee I normally drink. Okay, where shall we go? I hope you've thought it out. I say we go to that, that kid's house, see see his leather satchel, maybe there's more Greek in there, and then we go to the Greek expert. So here we go, Lollard Street, which is Shifty's house. Okay, 56 Southeast, where's our book good here? 56 Southeast. So for people who haven't played this before, you, you follow these leads and read these things until you think you know enough to answer questions you don't really know what the questions are going to be, but then you turn to the back and you get the questions. There's some main questions that pertain to your mystery. And then there might be some bonus questions that would just be maybe extra stuff you've discovered along the way, maybe not even related to your case. Um, and it is interesting in this case, case two, the Mudlark mystery, in the first one, someone came to us. They're like, we need you to solve this mystery for us, right? She was like, the woman came. She was scared. Solve it. This case, they're just like bored on their day off. This kid finds a finger. This is the kind of life these kids are leading. All right. So 56 Southeast. Here we go. Shifty is sitting in the backyard of the hostel, taking horseshoes out of a leather satchel and throwing them over his head, trying to make them land on a post six feet behind him. Surprisingly, he gets three out of four over the post while we watch. We offer some applause. Blimey, he says, noticing us for the first time. 
It's Tinker, and he's brought the cavalry. These are the irregulars, says Tinker. Lads, this is Shifty, one of the finest mudlarks in London. A pleasure, says Shifty, doffing his cap. So you lot work for that detective chap. I'm not about to be nicked, am I? No, Shifty, says Tinker. We just wanted to look at that satchel. We were trying to work out where the finger came from. Ah, that was a bobby dazzler of a curious find, and no mistake, says Shifty. I ain't never seen nothing like it. And sure, you can look at the satchel. The main thing I've noticed is these letters. He turns so we can see R-A embroidered on the outside of the bag in red. Not my initials, but I'm thinking of changing me name to match so I can carry it and be a proper dapper gent. We all laughed as Shifty swaggers around in a jaunty fashion with the, stat with the satchel over his shoulder. Anyhow, he continues, you can take it. I think I like me name as it is. He takes it off and throws it to us. Wiggins examines the bag. He looks to be, it looks to be a few years old. Take this too, adds Shifty. It was the only thing inside it, in one of the outside pockets. He passes us a sheet of paper. The ink has been blurred and muddled by the water of the river, but we can make out some words. I'm going to show it to you here, but it looks like 16th July RA, and then words are blurred out, and then a couple lines, and then it says Northwest 7 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Let's take a look at that together. So don't look at any of this other stuff. Maybe I'll hold it up so you're not tempted to cheat. Okay, can you see that? So, it's the date. It's three days ago, right? Because our mystery... No, sorry. Our mystery is June 17th. Oh, it was yesterday. Okay, well, that is compelling information. All right, so let's write down these. Let's note that we've gone to 56 Southeast, right? And at 56 Southeast, we've found the satchel note. And I'm going to say that's, I'm going to write down that it was on page two of our book in case we want to go back and look at that note later. And that note said 16th June RA. And then it looks like, it says Northwest 7 to 7.30, Northeast 7.30 to 8, Southeast 8 to 8.30, 8.30 p.m. end of shift. So it's some sort of... Um, it's a shift, like maybe a security guard who's walking. And it's actually got times. Now that I look at it, I can see if you look closely again. Sorry, let's give you a better look here. If you look closely again, uh, these are all half hour shifts. So the first thing looks like it says 5.30 to 6, 6 to 6.30. 6.30 to 7 is what it looks like to me. Looks like 5.30 to 6 p.m., 6.30 to... No, no, sorry. Looks like those are more... The last one is 7 p.m., but these look like maybe something to 6 and then 6, something to 6.30. Yeah, 6.30 to 7, 7. So it looks like it might be, to me, it might have started the shift at around 5.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. is end of shift. Maybe, although these times could be different. And then I can't quite make out what this word here is, but we can come back to that. 
All right, and then the other big clue from this is R A initials. Now, this might be a nice time to look at the newspaper and see if we notice any RAs. Oh, actually, look, we almost missed that it ends here, but actually continues up here. It says, thanks, Shifty, says Tinker. No worries, Tink. See you at the river. Circle the letter S. Okay, so this would be a good time if you watch the playthrough from before, you know about this, but it's worth talking a little bit about this. Uh, introduced new to the Sherlock Holmes consulting detective system recently and Mythos Tales used it. And I don't know if this is the first Sherlock Holmes game that has used this or not. I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't. But when you discover certain evidence, it instructs you to circle things. So we're on case two, so we're gonna circle that we discovered S. So now when we go somewhere, it may say, hey, if you've discovered, if you have the letter S circled, then you can read this paragraph, otherwise you find nothing. So it's a way of letting you, when you go to a place, you might ask about a certain thing that you found. So if you haven't found it, you can't ask about it. So, so we got a bunch of stuff there. So it's given us the note that we can ask about S. It's given us the initials. Or, it's give, or the satchel might be S, S for satchel, makes sense. Okay, so now we replace that place we went with the green to remind us that we've been there. And also it helps us keep track of how many turns. And I might in fact keep a separate note of just the places we've been to. There's a lot of bookkeeping in this game if you wanna you know, it's one of the, that's one of the challenges. We've talked about this before with, what, that I love. It's sort of a real world test of endurance and bookkeeping when you play these games. If you're sloppy and you hurry, like a real detective, you will miss things. So as I was saying, like now might be a nice time to look and see if there's any RA in our newspaper. It's a lot. A lot to, uh, it's a lot of newspaper to go through. Let's just quickly look at it. I mean, we could, we could go later. We could look at this later, but let's see. Um, entertainers. There were a lot of initials in this newspaper, remember? Like the section on the people who just graduated to the bar, there's like 500 initials and names and stuff. Okay. Let's look at this vandalism item. Ernest Tatson, a draper. Mr. Whitaker. I'm particularly interested in uh, any kind of security guard. Okay, close to the bar. I'm going to skip these bar stuff. Assault in Regent's Park. Let's look at this. Colin White was set upon by two men in the hospital, Regent's Park, no. Okay, Horticultural Society. Don't see anything, loan exhibit. Don't see anything. Letter to the editor about Patrick O'Brien, T.W. Russell. Having a great memory would be a real uh, uh, help in this game. I don't see any RAs lately. I mean, here, when I look through it, my second, second read through. All right, well, that was a good idea. Let's keep our ear open for RA. All right, we've been to the Shifty's place. Shall we go 
to the Greek expert. This is over here, by the way. Yeah, let's go to the Greek expert. 23, that's the person we found in the newspaper. And I'll just make a note here that we found that in the newspaper. Okay, so if you remember, it says, it's a, it's a personal ad. The Greek language rapidly acquired by application of a highly successful method of tuition. Apply personally or in writing to Miss Yahili, 23 Gota Street, Southeast. Okay, so let's, let's go visit with Miss Yabili and see if she can tell us what these weird writing on his finger is. Here we go. It is in the heart of the Greek area that we find the house of Miss Yabili, who is a slim, dark-haired woman. She has lots of cats, which wander around, eyeing us suspiciously as we enter the small sitting room. Luckily, Wiggins thought to copy out the tattoo before leaving Baker Street, so we are spared the awkwardness that would arise from arriving unannounced and presenting her with a severed finger. He shows her the symbols and asks her if she knows what they mean. It is Greek lettering, she replies. The letters are Zeta, Omega, Eta, Z, and Epsilon. In English, the equivalent letters are Z-O-E space X-E. This first word means life and is also a Greek woman's name. The second part is not a complete word that I know of. It is just two Greek letters. It could be the start of a lot of words or the first letters of a surname, but there are too many possibilities to even guess what it could be. Okay. Well, I guess we gotta write that down. So she just tells us what they are. She says Z-O-E space X E and the Z O E means life um, or a or a Greek woman's name I mean Zoe and she spells it out which I guess we will write here Zeta Omega Eta and then Z and Epsilon. Zoe Z. So it could be someone's surname. Okay, well, I mean, that did not help us much. It didn't give us another lead to look for. All right, let's replace that with that. Wow, I mean, like, shall we go search the area and the hospital or near the bridge, or it's time we could go to the um, to the medical examiner and find out more about this finger. That's my temptation. So this is the Greek neighborhood of London. Could be relevant for us. So if you look at this map, I don't know if you can see it, if it's zoomed in enough, but there are some red places which are sort of notable locations. You can see government offices are here. There's Waterloo Station, Lunatic Asylum, Bethlehem Lunatic Asylum, um, St. Thomas Hospital, Millbrank Prison, Westminster Abbey, Parliament. So the pinks, the reds are sort of interesting locations. And then there are some police precincts, which are in black and parks. Okay, that was a little diversion. All right, let's go to our last cube here. And then we'll, then we'll, then we'll start checking our informants and see what they know. So 29, which is where we're guessing was the place adjacent to where they found it, like the banks of the, the Thames near Westmin Westminster. 29 Southeast. Let's see if there's even an entry here for it. 29 Southeast. Okay.
The staff at St. Thomas Hospital tells us that no fingers are missing from any corpses as far as they are aware. We ask if anyone noticed anything unusual outside the hospital overnight. I was on nurse night duty, says one of the nurses, and I saw two men come running over the bridge just before 9.30 p.m. and sit on the wall by the river. They were quite agitated and excited, rapidly looking through a bag. They kept looking back towards the bridge. After about five minutes, they both ran off. That's a clue. So... That's it. So 29 Southeast, which is the hospital. The nurse tells us at 9.30 p.m. last night, two men, two men run over the bridge with a bag or a satchel, you might say. They're looking through it. They're sitting on a wall by the river, quite agitated. And five minutes, they both ran off. So did they rob someone of a bag? Freak out when they see this finger in it. Well, so, okay, let's go down here for a second. Let's look at this. Let's replace this. This is where we are. Okay, so if they come running over the bridge, they go and they sit down here. They go through the bag. So remember, there was like a theft and an assault. So we might be looking for something that might have happened around here, right? And then they come running off the bridge and they're looking through the bag. So sit on a wall by the river. They're quite agitated. They're looking through a bag. They're looking towards the bridge to see if anyone's following them, maybe. Okay, well, let's look at what's over here. We've got government's offices, Parliament, New Scotland Yard. We've got a big park here, St. James Park, Wellington Barracks, American Embassy, Wesleyan College, Millbank Prison, German Embassy, Card Club. War Office. Let's just look at the newspaper again. Where was that assault? Assault in Regent's Park. So where is Regent's Park? Where is Regent's Park? Well, let's look it up in the directory. Let's look it up there. Parks. Regent's Park is 97 Northwest. So 97 Northwest. There's Northwest. Ninety-six. Wow. Ninety-seven is all the way up top. There's Regent's Park. So um, I don't remember if we did this in the last case, but if you look at the corner here of this map, there's a little scale here that tells you how far someone could travel on foot in 15 minutes. So it looks like it's about maybe two and a half, three inches, so about this far in 15 minutes. So if someone were to try to run that far, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, that's a 90 minute run. And that's not, doesn't make sense. So that's not gonna be related to our thing, I don't think. He says nothing was stolen. And it doesn't even give us a time. All right. French military in Greece. And where was this vandalism?
I mean, it could, of course, be the same robbers just on a spree. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave this here at Regent's Park in case we want to go see anything about that park, and I'll just make a note of it in our list of potential clues. So we went 56, 23, and 29. And then in the newspaper, there was 97 newspaper Regents Park robbery. All right. So we've been there. Well, we have no other leads on the map and we have nothing in the newspaper that's jumping out to us what's this charge of murder and we don't know who the ra is i wonder if we should be keeping track of our questions like since in this game you have to sort of figure out what questions you might be asked, like question one is whose finger, right? Whose finger? Why is it, why is it in the river? Now you might add to that, who is R.A.? And I don't think they're going to be the same person, but they might be. If we track down R.A. and we find out he didn't have a finger, was he carrying it around with him? Let's see what the comments say. Go to the medical examiner. Yeah, I agree. I think it's time to go to the medical examiner. Um, we could go to the medical, medical examiner. We could also go to like a... So when he found the satchel, he was like, wow, look, I'm some rich guy with a satchel with my initials. It is true. That's a pretty fancy thing to have a satchel with your initials on it. Like maybe we could find the, the maker, the store that would have made this, this satchel and they might know who it belongs to. And that's, that's something worth like, can we track him by the, can we track R A by satchel maker? I'm not sure. Like, what what would you what what category would you look up? Like, is there are there are there bag makers? Like, what would you um what 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 would that be under? I wonder. Stationer tailor. Yeah, so I'm not sure like there's shoemakers, there's tailors. Would a tailor do it? No, no, a tailor knows how to make your suit fit. Um, there is also, in addition to our informants, I think if there's a Greek office here, like I know there are foreign office here, embassies, so there isn't a German, a Greek embassy. That's kind of weird. Russian, Spanish, German, French, Chinese. But there is a foreign office. Printer, shoemaker, tailor. Okay, let's go to the medical examiner. Let's see if we can find out how old this finger is. So let's look at our informants here. Um, H.R. Murray, the criminologist, analyzes all items and substances found during investigations. Maybe we go there and then maybe we... Oh, and then Jasper Meeks is the medical examiner. He performs autopsies of all bodies. And then maybe we hit the um, foreign office. Where's the foreign office? I guess that we don't. There's no informant for the foreign office. We just we might go in the directory for that. 
All right, let's go to H.R. Murray, the criminologist. I'm not sure, and then maybe the medical examiner as well. I'm not sure which one is more likely to know that, understand that finger. So let's make a note here that our next visit is going to be to 22 Southwest Criminologist. Okay. Should we put a mark on it? I guess we should. 22 Southwest. Four, twenty-three, twenty-two. Okay. That's the wrong thing. Twenty-two Southwest. As we enter the laboratory, Murray sits up with a start, and we get the impression we just woke him. I don't know anything about any missing fingers, he says sleepily in response to our questions. And there was no physical evidence left at the scene of the Regent's Park assault. We show him the tin and its gruesome contents. The salt is ordinary table salt, he says, and has been used to preserve the finger after removal. There are better things than table salt, but it does the job. I've forgotten all about the table salt. That kind of suggests that it was cut off recently and someone's preserving it. Or or he got his finger cut off and he's trying to preserve it. But where would you come across that much table salt? Like isn't that a little weird? Like your finger gets cut off. You'd have to you'd have to have the you'd have to be ready for that, right? You'd have to have the salt ready when you cut off someone's finger. I'm not sure why you're preserving it. Sometimes if you kidnap someone, you have to show proof of life, proof that you have them. So you cut off the finger and send that um, as part of your uh, kidnapping note to show that you mean business. So I guess that's an, it's nice that the guy doesn't have it. I mean, we've got it. So he's like, what are you talking about? Let me see it. I don't, I never heard anything about it. He says there's no evidence in the park. Well, then the medical examiner who performs autopsies, we're not going to go to him. So we just went there. He just reminds us it's in salt to preserve it, which we should have known. Well, wow, okay. RA. I'll tell you what, why don't we look up in the directory for any R's and see how many there are, how many RA's there are. Okay, I'm looking for people with the last names. Okay, Rambo Alban. That sounds familiar, Alban. These are the kind of detective things that I, that are kind of satisfying. Like, you know, when you ever see them track a serial killer, they're like, okay, the guy had a yellow Beetle convertible from 75. So then they're like, well, go look up every one and try to filter it down. Maybe you can get rid of some that were, you know, the wrong color. You get rid of some that were out of town. You make, you narrow it down to 100 and you, you do the, the brute force work of slowly meeting them all. So, so... So what we're going to do is, so R, A, in directory. So we've got, uh, what did I say, Richard Alban. It looks like there aren't so many that this is, that this would be out of the question. So Rambo Alban is 21 Southeast. Then we've got Rankin Abbey, 
39 east. I mean, hold on a second. So I'm looking up RA, last name R, but that's not probably what we want, right? If you've got your initials on your bag, then it's probably first initial, second initial. So we should be looking for A's, right? A's with R as our first name. So we've got Ruth Abbott. 38 Northwest. If we had to choose, it would be someone in the, if we had to guess, we'd be looking for a Southwest, Southeast person or South, probably Southwest person. So let's keep our eyes on for Southwest name. R A, first name R, last name A, okay. Uh, Ronald Adair. Let's put this down here. So Ronald Adair, and almost certainly a man's name, right? 59 Northwest. I'll write them all down, but then we'll go to the men. Rose Aleo, and if we find someone Greek, all the better, right? Rosalind Albright, 70 East. Rumson, and you let me know if any of these ring a bell from newspaper. Algert, 15 South. Richard Allen, one W C, Rollin Amberg, seventeen South. A lot of A's. Robert Angel. 49 Southwest. Rudolfo. Ariano. None of these jump out at me as being Clearly Greek. Okay, that's our A's. Just double checking here. And of course, no guarantee that this is. All right. Well, are any of our people Southwest? Yes, I've got one here, Robert Angel, 49 Southwest. 49 Southwest is pretty far away from the crime. What about any, that's our only Southwest. What about any WC? So we've got a 53 WC. Looking for any that might be right near here. 
53WC looks like it's around here somewhere. Then we've got a 1WC just there. And one of those are all that close to our bridge. What about a northwest close to our bridge? We've got a 59 northwest. Northwest, somewhere here. Not very close. Huh. Well, just because they don't live near there doesn't mean. But given that we don't have anyone right near there, well, okay, maybe they were headed towards maybe southeast. East. South. Hmm. I mean, no one jumps out at me on this list. We could go visit all of them, clearly. But I feel like that would be a little unreasonable. These kids are bored. They're not going to go check to every house. Well... So here's another idea. Where did he get the tattoo? Might we, are there any tattoo shops in the London directory? I don't think there are. I don't remember seeing any tattoo shops. In the 1800s, it was probably much, wasn't like there it is now, a tattoo shop on every corner. But I do see Tattoo Emporium. 24 e but e isn't a um, isn't a location on the map there's certain locations that are here for like flavor but they're actually not available on the map so you can't go there there's no e section in there to look up northwest west central east central southeast southwest that's unfortunate. I don't, I'm pretty sure there's no, if it's not on the map, it's not on the thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, let's think for a second here. The it could be someone's name, right? Zo something. But, and then her last, if it is, a, could the person said, well, it could be the start of someone's last name. Although that's a little odd concept. Like, it's a tattoo. You're not going to, it's not like they wrote it and got interrupted. But, I mean, we could look up that XE and just see if someone's got a last name of XE. Well, there's a Zorba Zenos. I mean, that's a Greek name, Zorba. Seems unlikely, but 65 Southeast is in our ballpark. What do you think? I think we should go there. But then we got to go back and, and start thinking about informants. But let's try this 65 Southeast. Let's see if there's an entry for it. 65 Southeast. If there is, then we'll record what it's about. There's an entry here, 65 Southeast. Zorba Zenos does not understand much of our story. We ask him if the letters Zeta, Omega, and Eta mean anything to him. It is my grandmother's name, Zoe. She is buried 
in the South Metropolitan Cemetery in the southern part of London. He's not like I recognize the tattoo. He's like Zoe is my grandmother's name. So other people might be named Zoe. It might not be related, but it might. So we went to 65 Southeast to Zoe. Okay, so it's 65 Southeast. We find out Zoe is buried grandmother. Let's read this again. Zorba Zenos does not understand much of our story. We ask in the letter Zeta, Omega, and Ada mean anything to him. It is my grandmother's name, Zoe. So she's going to be an old woman. She's buried in South... South Metropolitan Cemetery. Now, there is something in our newspaper about cemeteries, right? Let's go back and look at that after we put our marker. So we went there. Okay, now let's put our new marker at the South Metropolitan Cemetery. Where is that? Let's look it up. I'm enjoying this case. It's sort of like, I like not, it's interesting that like in some cases you've just got like so many leads and clues to follow. And this one, um, I feel like they're, you know, we're sort of having to fight for each clue. So, South. Okay, I don't see it in the directory. Let's see if there's a cemetery section here. Churches, chemists. Okay, I don't see it, but let's. I'm going to put this here to remind us. And these are going to, this is going to be our pile of. We, 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 one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, I guess we did five. Okay. Um, we've got to, we've got to find this. Let's see if we're given some information at the newspaper where to go. Here, listen to this. The Stanbridge Foundation for the Care of London Ceremon uh, Cemeteries invites new members with an express desire to maintain the city's Great funeral monuments in a respectful and dignified condition to apply in person at 82 Southwark Bridge Road, Southwark Bridge Road, SE, Southeast. So that sounds like that could be our cemetery. 82 SE is here. So, and that's from the newspaper. I'm going to break off my first page where we're keeping track of each clue we pursue. We follow one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, fine. All right, I say we go here and see if the cemetery has got any information for us. If the Preservation Society has any information for us. So 82 Southeast, call this the Cemetery Society. I don't know, did they have a name in the newspaper? Stanbridge Foundation. For the care of London Cemetery, Stanbridge. Okay, 82 Southeast. Let's put our marker on top to tell us we're traveling there and let's go travel. I have a good feeling about this.
82 Southeast. Eighty two Southeast. Do you have a circled N? We do not, right? We only have the S. If not, you are nothing useful at eighty two Southeast. Okay, so we need so we're on the right path, but we're not ready to get information from them. So now let's really remember to be careful last time because, I mean this time, because last time when we went, there was a clue we didn't go to because there was a different color cube on it and we thought we had already gone there. So we're going to use this gold to mean we need to go back to there. These colored cubes really come in handy, don't they? All right, this is terrible, this coffee. Well, so we know something is going on with that guy's mother. But he doesn't have any other relatives, right? Like we looked up that guy's name. Z. So, um... What we did was we looked up, we looked up as if the last name was XE, right? And we found Zorba Zenos. And then now we think the tattoo might have said Zoe Zenos or Zoe Z. I wonder, um, so here's a question. Did the cutoff finger, are we to um, believe that it may have gotten cut off where that XE was? Like, is that why there's only an XE? Where did it, where did we learn the, the, where did we, in the introduction, we must have been told the, the letters. Um, one thing I note is a tattoo along the finger side near the knuckle joint. Notice the black shapes marked Zoe Z. Could be Greek letters. All right, it doesn't say it, but I wonder if it's that like it was cut off at the at the knuckle. Didn't was there an illustration of it? No. So maybe the Z continued on and it was his full name. What was Zenos? And it was just that it was cut off there. Either way, if that was the grandmother's name tattooed on someone's finger, it could be the grandfather, right? With his wife's name tattooed or the son. But this guy, like, don't you think we would tell him like, he's like, oh yeah, that's my grandmother. That, I mean, Zoe, that's the name of my grandmother. Maybe we should say, hey, we found a finger. Is this your dad's finger? Or your grandfather's finger? Why didn't we ask him more information? It seems like we should have asked him more information. And the cemetery club wants more information. What do you think N is? There's no other Xenos in the directory. So it's not like we can look up other family members. It was only Zorba with that last name. Let's look at that cemetery thing again. Implying person at 82 Southwest Branch Road. Okay. So this is the first time that we've gotten to a paragraph and not had the evidence that we needed. In the other game, we were always one step ahead of it. Okay, it looks like we've got someone new in the chat, which is kind of exciting. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, I'll let the chat people, um, but welcome. Welcome to the channel. It's great to have someone new here. So, 
we're not sure where to go now. We know we've got some good information about the woman being buried in the cemetery. Where we still don't know who RA is, right? We still got if we have to, if we run out of stuff, we could start knocking on doors of these RAs. Let's assume for a second that whoever is RA, the owner of the satchel, had the finger in the bag and that they were robbed, the bag stolen, the robbers were searching through that bag found the finger, found the finger, panicked and threw it in the thing or some, that's, that's sort of the working hypothesis I have. Now, why would RA have that finger in there? Maybe RA just cut off the finger. If it's in salt, it's, it's obviously not a, it's not a 20 year old finger, right? But it could be RA's finger. They were looking towards the bridge, coming over the bridge. Parliament, I mean, this could be government offices. So who is RA? And the note in RA looked like it was a on first glance to me, it looked like it was, it was um, like a guard's walking thing. We wrote down what page it was. I think it was page four. But it, it was a blurred out thing. And it looked like it might have been. Let's look at it again here. A shift, like a... a, a a guard's shift or even a police officer's shift. 16th June, which was the day before this happened. I can't read what that first word said. Northwest, Northeast, Southeast. Northwest, Northeast, Southeast, end of shift. And it looks like they're sort of going in circles because the first, the blurry ones are sort of are south something, south, south, north. So is it possible it's a security guard around one of these buildings here, around Westminster Abbey, government offices? Barracks, American Embassy, Post Office, Prison Guard. Hold on a second. Prison, there's a prison, Milbank's prison here. Is it possible it's a prison guard's shift? Let's go to the prison. Let's check it out. 23 Southwest. I mean, I like the idea that that note might have been a shift at the prison. Just an idea. 23 Southwest. All right. 23 Southwest. There's a big log entry here. And guess what it says? Do you have a circled S? That's our satchel. If not, you are nothing useful at Millbank. If you do, read on. All right, guys, this is where we break this case wide open. At the imposing wall of Millbank Prison, we are lucky to find the familiar face of Constable Peterson of Scotland Yard. Hello, Constable, says Wiggins. We're on a case and wondered if we might be able to speak to someone who works at the prison. It's possible, he says. Wait here. About 20 minutes later, he returns and leads us through a heavy metal door across the yard and into the main prison building. I never thought I'd willingly walk into this place, mutters Simpson. Another one of the irregulars. 
In a small office, we are introduced to prison officer Johann Huber, a bespectacled German man. We ask him if anyone with the initials R.A. works at the prison. Yes, he replies. There is a god called Robin Aves. Has he ever done anything suspicious? Not that I recall. He used to be late for his shifts, but that's because he's largely illiterate. He can read well enough, but if he has to write down details himself, he really makes lots of errors. Since I arranged for another guard to write out his shifts for him, he has always been on time. He's not here now, but you might find him at home at 27 Brick Street. We have a German person who has joined the chat. Very interesting timing. Thank you, Mr. Huber, says Wiggins. And has anything unusual happened at Millbank recently? Huber's eyes narrow. Yes, he says. I'm curious how you would know. Yesterday, someone cut a finger off Walter Stern's corpse, one of our prisoners who died on Wednesday. Is his body still here? asks Wiggins. He was cremated today. We do not have the facilities to leave bodies lying around for long. I see. Can you tell us more about Stern? Found dead in his room Wednesday morning. The prison doctor said it was a heart attack. Huber looks in a drawer and pulls out a file. He was a tattoo artist from Norwood, convicted of six counts of burglary on 2nd December 1884. Sentenced to 20 years in prison. The arresting officer, the arresting officer was Inspector Wadlow of Scotland Yard. If you want to know more, I could let you speak to Cedric Tallow. He shared a cell with Walter. Now, that name sounds a little familiar. From the newspaper, maybe? Or maybe I'm wrong. We agree, and Huber leads us down a corridor and into a dark room where he tells us to wait. He does not return for some minutes, and for a moment we fear he's forgotten about us. And we're going to be left in this grim place to rot. But then he reappears, escorting a long-haired, disheveled man with a hooked nose and deep-set eyes. It is impossible to tell his age. Hello, Mr. Tallow, begins Wiggins nervously. We're hoping you can tell us about Walter Stern. If you cooperate, I will organize privileges, says Huber. Oh, that's our, that's our, that's our, which guy is Huber? Oh, that's our German. That's our, that's our guy. If you cooperate, I will organize privileges, says Huber. Cigarettes, asks Tallow in a hoarse voice, and Huber nods. Tallow grins. Walter, he says, had quite a talent. He did this for me. He points to a tattoo of a burning skull on his arm. What tattoos did he have, asks Wiggins. He didn't have many. He said he only trusted himself to do it right. So that limited where he could put them. What about one on his finger? Funny you mention it. He did it on the first day I met him. His first day in here. I asked him what it meant. He said a friend wanted assurance that he would never forget something. So he was making sure he would always have it to hand. Then he laughed. But realized he'd accidentally made a joke. To hand, get it? Wiggins nods. And do you know who this friend was? Nah, but from the way he smoked, I put money on it being a woman, perhaps a lover who was writing to him to make sure he always remembered her. He said when he wrote to them to say he tattooed something on his finger as a reminder, they were reassured because they knew he wouldn't forget. And did he have any Greek connections that you know of? Never heard him mention any. Huber steps forward and takes Tallow by the arm. We'll have to end there, lads, he says. I'll have one of the guards show you out. A few moments later, we are standing on Vauxhill Bridge Road, feeling very grateful to be out of such an oppressive place. Circle the letter W. 
All right, well, we got a lot of information on that visit to Millbrank Prison because we figured out it was a guard's shift log. We didn't get the N for the cemetery, though. We got a different letter, W. All right, let's back up now with the voices and figure out all the information we were told here, quite a bit. First, we were told who R.A. was. R.A. is Robin Avis. Now, here's something cool. We made our lists of R.A.'s in the directory, about 10 of them. And um, I thought Robin Avis was in there, but now I don't see it. All right, well, that's not cool then. Robin Avis. I'll have to see. I'm curious. I'm just going to look that up whether I missed that. No, he's not in the directory. Okay, that's interesting. So we now know who R.A. is. R.A. is Robin Avis. And who is Robin Avis? Well, he was a guard. He can read, but he's barely literate. And he lives at 27 Brick Street, which is another location for us. 23 Southwest we went to. Okay. All right. So we're going to go check out his home, but... What, uh, I arranged for a guard to write out his shift. He's always been on time. He's not here now. You might find him at home. I don't think we're going to find him at home. But maybe. Um, okay, now we ask if anything interesting happened at the prison. And he says, yes. He says, yesterday, which is the 16th. Today's the 17th, Friday. Someone cut a finger off a corpse. So we now know whose finger it is. It's Walter Stern is the dead finger, owner of the dead finger. Died on Wednesday. Died on Wednesday. Thursday, the finger's cut off. Today is Friday. He's been incinerated. Okay. So Walter Stern is found dead in his room. The doctor says it's heart attack. And this guy was a tattoo artist. Tattooed himself. All right, he's got a criminal record. Burglary, six counts. He's a professional burglar. Burglary, so... It's sounding like he stole something and then tattooed to remember it. Um, okay, so he dies maybe of a heart attack, maybe not. Someone cuts off his finger, we don't know who. We get his cellmate. Oh, and we're told actually arresting officer. So we might want to check the police about his history of burglary. I mean, I think we will. Um, the arresting officer was Wadlow. All right, so that might be, we go to, we'll go to Scotland Yard, we'll check the police records, but we could even go to the cop's house if we can find him in the directory if, he, if he's not at the office. Okay, so he shared a cell. They bring us to the guy who he shared the cell with. He says... He's a tattoo artist. He didn't have many. He only trusted himself, so he puts one on himself. He says, it's funny you mention it. So the first day after he gets arrested for his latest stint, he tattoos this on his finger. The guy asked him what he meant, and he said a friend wanted assurance that he would never forget something. So he was making sure he would always have it to hand. 
Then he laughed, realizing he'd accidentally make a joke to hand. And do you know who this friend was? I put money on it being a woman. Perhaps a lover was writing him to make sure he always remembered her. He said when he wrote to them to say he tattooed something on his finger as a reminder, they were reassured because they knew he wouldn't forget. Did he have any Greek connections? No. It sounds like it's... It doesn't... It, like, it sounds... Like he's trying to remember some combination or something to money. Like it, it doesn't doesn't match up with remembering a woman, right? Like even though we found this potential lead that it's a that it's this white woman who died. This is sort of suggesting that like maybe there was some other reason why he was supposed to remember these symbols. Like maybe that was just a red herring that it connects to this woman who's in the cemetery. Like maybe she's not related to this at all. I mean, I think we definitely have to check out his record and see if he was involved in some huge burglary where there's missing stuff that he's hidden and he wants to make sure he doesn't forget it. Although it's the guard who's Ill illiterate. It would make sense. Like did the guard so did the guard, who, who's semi-illiterate, R.A., right? He knows, he hears about that this burglar has hidden some heist somewhere. And he knows he's, so, he's illiterate, so he can't copy the, the, the symbols or remember them. So he basically cuts off the finger to bring with him. Just needs to preserve it enough so he can keep reading those symbols to unlock or discover the... The, the hidden heist. That seems very tempting to me. Um, okay, so that's great. So, and that had a circle N, or sorry, W, but we're still missing the N, right? We still don't know where the N is for the cemetery. But, so, is it possible that... It's the gravestone under which the robbery was hidden. So it is the name of the woman, but it's her gravestone that he has to, that he's going to go look for in the cemetery, which is a perfect reminder of one of the best movies ever made, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Do you remember the connection between what we're what we've got here and that movie? If you haven't seen that movie, one of the best movies ever made, like top ten. Okay, perfect time for a five minute break. We'll come back and we'll see if we can find this guy's criminal history and if there's some big heist that he's involved in. So we'll see you in five minutes.
Okay, we're back. You're watching Co-op for Two, broadcasting live from Champaign, Illinois. We just went to Millbank's Millbank Prison and broke the case wide open. And now I think I was just looking at the newspaper to see is it possible like that maybe they were going to dig up the cemetery and that's why everyone had to move fast. Um, did we see any other names here? I was just... Spectre Wadwell. I thought I read a name that jumped out as familiar, but that's... I, when I play these games, I tend to get overly excited and think I recommend... think I recognize every name Cedric Tallow Walter Stern is the guy with the dead finger so we could also go visit Robin we could visit RA two guys looking through All right, we've got a bunch of leads to to follow through. I think uh, let's put let's put leads where we know they are. Robin Avis, who I think we concluded was not in the directory, lives at twenty seven Brick Street. So, if he's not in, here's a, interesting. If he's not in directory. Does that mean he's at a boarding house or something like that? 27 Brick Street. Where do you think? That means it's 27, but do we know? Like, all right, let's assume he lives near the prison. And let's look for a 27 that might have Brick Street. If you knew this, if you knew London well, you might know where Brick Street is. But I do not. There's 27 here. I don't see any Brick Streets. It was telling us his location as if it was fairly confident that that was all we would need to know. Um, Robin Avis, he's not here. You might find him at home at 27 Brick Street. All right, well, we need a better, we need a lo neighborhood location if we're going to look him up from 27 Brick Street. Here's a 27 Metropole Hotel. Let's see if that's on Brick Street in the directory. Twenty seven WC. I mean that's pretty convincing. He's not in the directory. He's just a guard. He's poor. He's you know relatively poor. He doesn't have his own big house. Um, that would be a logical place for him to live. But here's another twenty seven down here. Let's just put a marker here. I don't see Brick Street though in either place. You would think that it would be labeled Brick Street. It's kind of confusing. But London is a very convoluted, confusing thing. They've done, you know, they, they've... <clears throat> London is so convoluted, the layout of the streets, that the taxi drivers have to go through some incredible amount of training. And they've actually done like neuroscience studies of the hippocampal regions of, um, of the taxi drivers in London because we think hippocampus is spatial navigation and building maps and stuff. So they've actually... Okay, um, so we've put a marker there for possibly the location of Robin Avis, but I have a feeling he's not coming home. Like I think those 
two robbers robbed him of his satchel and maybe he's in the river or wait a second um, that robbery assault in Regent's Park a young man Colin White was set upon so yeah that's not related but I wonder if he was robbed and like he can't even like even he might be alive they robbed him and he's still alive but he's not going to say anything or they killed him and stole it but that would be kind of unusual Okay, so that's Robin Avis. Avis. We don't quite know exactly where. We think that might be 27WC. And then the one I'm most interested in is Walter Stearns, the, the person who was arrested for burglary. So for him, we want to go to the police station. So with Strahd, we could go to... And we might even check... If, the, if our detective that we know is on the case isn't there, we might try to look him up directly. Any preferences for where we go first? Shall we try to track down RA's home or do you want to track, go to the police station first? While you're figuring that out in the chat, I'm going to see if um, we can look up Wadlo, this officer. who's in charge of this case. Was it Waddell or Wadwell? I'm gonna have to look that up again. Wadwell, Inspector Wadwell of Scotland Yard. All right, I guess we're just gonna go to Scotland Yard because there's no Wadwell in the directory. Although I suppose if we look at police, Precincts, police stations, Scotland Yard. Well, he was in Scotland Yard. Okay. All right. Uh, no comment in the chat channel. That's fine. I'll just take it from here. Um, let's go to the police, uh, to Scotland Yard first. 13 SW Lestrade. Scotland Yard. I suppose we should put a marker on it. 13 Southwest, Scotland Yard. There we go. Okay. Hello, Inspector, says Wiggins. Any interesting crimes happen overnight? Burglaries or muggings, perhaps? Lestrade shakes his head. Nothing like that reported, he says. There was an assault in an isolated spot in Regent's Park. The victim was a young man named Colin White. He was set upon by two men and badly beaten, but nothing was taken. He's now in Middlesex Hospital and professes not to know why he was attacked. Circle the letter R. Well, it really is starting to seem like there is a connection with that assault in Regent's Park. Do you have a circled S or double yet? Yeah, yes, we have both. If so, read the relevant sections below. Be sure only to read the sections you have letters for. So we have S and W, so we're gonna read both of these. Do you have any policemen? Do any policemen have the initials RA? Asks Simpson. Lestrade thinks for a moment. Only one I can think of, he replies. Robert Angel. So, that's, okay, so that's weird. Like, that's sending us on the wrong path, right? Because we went to Scotland Yard. Yard, which we're now going to, we should put a green here saying we're here. Let's give you a little view of the board as it stands. So that's where we are in Scotland Yard now, here, here. This is where we think the other guy may live. Um, so we went to the prison and he said, oh, R.A. is Robin Avis. He's the guard. Now we've gone to Scotland Yard and Lestrade said, well, I do have an R.A. who's a policeman. That's someone different. He's saying Robert Angel. We think that's a red herring. 
because that bag does not belong to a policeman. That's our guard's bag. All right, so that's, that's a red herring. But now he's asking if we have W. This is the guy, this is gonna be the guy who, Waddell, the, the detective that worked on our case of the guy in prison. We asked to speak to Inspector Wadlow, who is a broad-shouldered man in his early 50s with a shock of gray hair. We knew Stern would strike again, he says, in response to our questions. An informant told us he would hit a house in Lower Norwood, South London. So we had a patrol ready. We saw him climb out over the wall of Lord Peaford's estate on Lansdowne Hill, and we gave chase. He ran through a small park and woodland and then through part of the South Metropolitan Cemetery. And we caught him coming out the other side. He had clumsily concealed most of the jewelry under a rock, but there was one piece we never found, the Arabelli Pearl, a tiny jewel worth a small fortune. Lord Peaford was most disappointed that we didn't recover it. We searched around the rock and all along Stern's route, but the pearl was so small, it was like looking for a needle in a haystack. It probably still out there somewhere, waiting to make some lucky person very rich. Did Stern work alone? Asked Simpson. No. We were sure there was someone helping him plan the burglaries but we never found out who. Circle the letter N. All right, I think we've, we've got, we've, we're, we're, we're on to the right path here. So we're gonna trace this path. He went through the cemetery. He buried the pearl under the gravestone of this woman. Captain in his head was arrested that night and then quickly tattooed the name of the gravestone on his finger called his partner out and said, I'm not going to tell you where it is, but I, I've got it. I've written it down. It's safe. So we're going to make some notes about that. And I think that N was the letter that we need to go to the cemetery, right? I think it asked us if we had N. But what we should write down, what I want to write down is, let's see, that was 13. That was 13. We talked to that detective. That was great. And we could only get that information from him because we first went to the jail. That told us Waddell is the person to talk to in Scotland Yard. But uh, what did I want to write down? Um, I was going to make notes from this, but I wanted to write down something first. Well, I've, it's, it's escaped my mind with all my rambling. Um, okay, so... At 13 Southwest. Um, so he went to Lord P. Ford Estate on, La uh, on Lower Norwood. South London. Okay, where they were waiting for him. When, and that, that Lord Peaford is lands downhill. Lands downhill in Lower Norwood. He ran through park, right? Ran through the park and woodland. Then through the cemetery, and they caught him coming out, and it's the Arabelli Pearl, which is going to be worth a lot of money, a small fortune. Uh, did Stern work alone? No, we were sure there was someone helping him plan the burglaries, but we never found out who. Oh, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to write down these new questions that we think we're going to have to answer. So whose finger? We think we know who that is. That's Walter's finger. Um, 
Why is it in the river? We still haven't locked that down, but I think this guy was robbed. Who is RA? We figured that out. But then I think like, who is Walter Stern's partner? The mystery partner that he talked to on the phone. It's not gonna be the, it's not gonna be the guard. He wouldn't talk to him on the phone. He'd talk to him in person. In person. Okay. Well, that was a fantastic uh, little piece of evidence there. Um, let's find out where this uh, Peaford's estate is and track and watch him go through the park. So didn't we think the park was here, right? We marked it in gold so we would remember to come back to the cemetery. Oh, no. 82 was where the 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 cemetery club is the preservation of the cemetery club but we didn't really find the the cemetery but let's let's find peaford's place and then maybe it is near there somewhere so is lord peaford his house hmm I don't see Peaford here. That seems unlikely. Lower Norwood. Let's find this again. Uh, Lower Norwood in South London. Oh, maybe it's not on our map. Maybe it's not on our map. Like that cemetery may not be on our map. Like is it down here somewhere? And we're just being told information about, like, it's near Lord Peaford, um, near the cemetery. So maybe we can't actually go there. Uh, I guess it's not important. And we're, we, we, we are getting a feel for, like, there's some connection to Regent's Park. Like, that assault. This guy was assaulted at Regent's Park, right? Colin White was set upon... Put him in the hospital. He says nothing is stolen. There was no motive. And he claims it's unprepared. I mean, he claims nothing was stolen and he can't say why. And our detective at Scotland Yard thinks that's a little suspicious. But Regent's Park, I mean, that's... That's very far away from all the action here. And far away from the cemetery. The cemetery, if it's anywhere, it's down here below this map. Let's go back to the cemetery club and see what they know about that cemetery. So 82 Southeast. Ward Peaford. I wouldn't mind talking to Ward Peaford though. He doesn't seem to be someone we can talk to for now. We may have to, we may have to read the newspaper to see if he's some famous person involved in something that we could go meet him while he's in London. So we'll be checking the newspaper in a second. But we're going back to the cemetery club. What are they called? The Stanbridge, Stanbridge Foundation for the Care of London Cemeteries. 82 Southeast. Do you have a circled N? Remember we were here and we didn't have an N, but now we do. The Stanbridge Foundation for the Care of London Cemeteries is a tiny house on the corner of Suffolk Street and Southwark Bridge Road. We speak to a small bespectacled old lady who introduces herself as Miss Gladys Stanbridge. What can you tell us about the South Metropolitan Cemetery, Miss Stanbridge? asked Wiggins. Ah, a lovely South Cemetery, she replies. If you visit, you will see an excellent collection of sepulchral monuments. And I do recommend the chapel. It has an enormous columbarium. She pulls out a book and leafs through it for a moment. The cemetery was founded by an act of parliament in 1836 and consecrated by the Bishop of Winchester. In 1842, a section of the ceremony, cemetery, 
sorry, I'm getting senile, was set aside for use by the Greek Orthodox community. Over the last 50 years, the Greek section has become a very popular place to be buried, and the graves there now number in the thousands. So, thousands of graves. You'd need to write down and remember whose grave you buried it under. Okay. Well, I mean, that's that. We don't, we've got that part of the mystery figured out. Here's a little aside. If you like prank phone calls, search for Gladys and the Dog Beaters. Her name, that Roman's name was Gladys. Gladys and the Dog Beaters by uh, a guy who had a show called Blackout's Box. It's one of the funniest prank calls I can remember listening to up there with Jerky Boy stuff, but I don't know how well it survived. I don't know how well it holds up after 20 years, but... Pretty funny. Gladys is a recurring character of his. Okay, so we went to that. We went to her. She gave us all the information we needed. We actually didn't tell us anything new there. Just confirmed our suspicion. So let's assume that's happening all down here below the map in South London. So they know he's robbing this place of this lord. He steals jewelry and this special pearl. The police had it staked out. He runs, right? He runs through the cemetery, quickly has time to bury the pearl in South Bridge, whatever, South something cemetery. Remembers in his head the name of the woman uh, whose grave it was. Gets caught, knows he's gonna get caught, right? Or, or he'll go back. Gets arrested, put in jail. Immediately that day that he's in jail, he has it tattooed, the name of the woman's, the name of the gravestone on his finger so he won't forget it. But then he called and told his friend, like, I wouldn't mind looking again at the prison thing to see exactly what he says about calling his friend. He says... He did it on the first day he was in here. He said a friend wanted assurance that he would never forget something, so he was making sure he would always have it to hand. Do you know who the friend was? Nah, but from the way he spoke, I'd put money on it being a woman, perhaps a lover who was writing to him to make sure he would always remember her. He said he wrote to them to say he tattooed something on his finger as a reminder. They were reassured because they knew he wouldn't forget. Well, I suppose it's worth considering the possibility that the guard was the partner and actually got a job in the prison just to get at him. Let's read more about this guard. Does anyone uh, work here with RA? There's a guard called Robin Avis. Has he done anything suspicious? Not that I recall. He used to be late for his shifts that because he's largely illiterate. He can read well enough, but he has to write it down. He's always been on time, but he's not here now. You can find him at home. I mean, I was working under the assumption that maybe he heard about the robbery of this guy, uh, that this guy had tattooed his finger. But I suppose the other, the other way you could look at that is if this burglary, burglar didn't blab that he had robbed and hidden this thing and that this was the gravestone name, then someone else would have, if the guard didn't overhear it, someone would have told him. So either he was the partner or the partner contacted the guard and made a deal. So we still don't know who the partner was or how the guard found out about it. But I think now we try to locate the guard, see if he's dead, alive, 
if he's alive, what's his story? No comments, so we're just gonna go on our own now. Um, so we went to Scotland Yard. Was that really the last place? We, no, we, then we went to 82 Southwest. And this was the grave place. And I think the cemetery is just is off our map. Okay, let's see if we can find Robin, Robin Avis at his house on Brick Street, which we're not sure is here, but there is a hotel there. It would make sense that that's... Well, would it make sense that the guard is living at a hotel? Wouldn't it make more sense that he's living at like a boarding house? Hotel seems like it's for people with money for short stays. Well, just because there's a hotel here doesn't mean there aren't other houses in that area. But let's, let's, we'll try to, we'll, we'll look up 27WC. If it's not there, we will try to find his Brick Street a different way. Okay, so 27WC is not there. So that's not where he lives. So we tried 27WC, which wasn't a real lead. So where does this guy live then? We went to the prison, which was at 23 South W. Robin Avis. He's not here. Find him at home at 27 Brick Street. Well, I mean, it, you would think it'd be near the near this. Um, Maybe it's this other 27. Lupus Street, Gloucester Street, Sussex Street, but then there is a street that's not quite marked. So let's try 27 Southwest. Nope. So it's not at 27 Southwest either. And I'm, am I right that we looked it up we tried, I mean, I've looked, tried to look him up a couple times because he's not, because he wasn't in our list of A's, which is a little weird. Wait a minute. Yeah. Okay. Well, Where would he live? Where, we've checked here. Do we, do we need another marker for places we've already been? Or we just got to remember. Okay, we checked this one. We checked this 27. We checked this 27. Here's another 27. But again, no Brick Street. But it would make sense. I mean, these are the places around here. So let's try 27. Southeast. Sure, we're going to find this guy's house. No. Nope. God, that's weird. Well, this gets back to trusting the, the writer and the designer. And how much do you trust for a typo or a bug? So here's a cool idea. So, so far we haven't been able to find him. He was at 27 Brick Street, right? So, one possibility is we have to keep finding Brick Street and find it. But what's the other possibility? That he gave a fake home address? How's that for a cool idea? Um, let's keep looking for Brick Street and see if we can find it in some one of the other 27. So, EC... There's 27 Bread Street, or is it a typo? I mean, you, with the, with these games, the, the Sherlock Holmes ga type games are known to have typos, but I like the idea that it was a false address, and that's why he's not in the directory, and he's not, okay. Well, here's a 27, uh, and I don't see any brick here, and all the streets are labeled. Okay. Now let's, we've already looked at Southwest. Let's look over Northwest. It's possible, is it near Regent's Park? 
like, is it possible that Colin White is Robin Avis? Like, he's the partner, and he got a job under this false name. It didn't say how long he's been working there. Um, let's look up 27 here, just to see if we can't find Brick Street. There's 25. Or is it the other cop? Yeah. I was going to say, would you really have your initials monogrammed on a thing if it wasn't you? But what if he's the cop who's R.A. and he's masquerading with a fake name, Robin... Avis. So maybe we do have to check out that cop. We were saying initially it was like a red herring. We know the RA cop is not involved, but what if the RA is the real name of the person masquerading as a guard under a different name? All right, so but we did want to, let's first rule out our 27 Northwest to make sure there's no Brick Street there. I'm like, I'm, I mean, I'm, lo I'm, I'm in love with the idea that that he gave a fake name and a fake home address. But sometimes you come up with these things that aren't, that are just asking for too much. Um, 27, 22, 24, 25, 26, 30, 29, 28, 27. Oh, there's Brick Street. Okay, so maybe we were overthinking it because there is, sorry, not from here. So there's our 27 Brick Street. Okay, so maybe it's not a fake name after all. I, I was, sometimes you, you think of something that it's just too good to be true. Okay, 27 Northwest. Okay, here we go. 27 Northwest. Just as a reminder, this is the guards where the guard lives. So let's write it down. Now remember, we think the guard cut off the finger and went looking for this grave. So we think this guard is up to no good. If you have a circled V, skip straight, straight to something. We don't. Only read on if you have a circled V. If you do not have a circled V, you read this. As we approach the house, we notice the window to the left of the door is open and through it we can see a bald man sitting at a desk. We knock and he comes to the door. Mr. Robin Avis asks Wiggins. Yes, he replies. We think we found something that belongs to you. Wiggins holds up the satchel. Avis steps back and puts his hand to his chest, clearly in shock. He takes a moment to compose himself, and then something seems to dawn on him. He leans forward and he says quietly, I see your game. Is everything in the bag? You must have pocketed the money, but what about the tin? There'll be more money for you if you hand it over. We only found the bag, Mr. Avis. What is it in particular you want? He looks confused for a moment, then says, Give it back, you thief. He steps forward and reaches for Wiggins, and we turn and run. As we approach Piccadilly, Tinker looks back and shouts, He's following us, Wiggins. Let's duck into this boarding house, says Wiggins, so he'll think it's where we live. Turn to 63W, but do not count it as an extra lead for scoring purposes. So that was 27 Northwest. So we have to, um, we have to make an important note here that it wants us to have V. Like, but I don't think, I'm not sure we can come back here, but if, okay. Uh, 27 Northwest, if you have V, skip to the second section, which we don't have, so we couldn't read that. Okay, and then it tells us to go to 63 North 
west, but don't count it as an extra lead that we followed. So we'll write it down here, 63 northwest, but don't count it. Don't count when you're scoring, but we don't care about that. So let's see, where is 63 northwest? So we just went there and we ran from him and we ended up here near the Piccadilly Hotel. All right, let's read 63 Northwest. Only read on if you have been directed here from another location. Otherwise, you find nothing. All right, so we, we caught our breath. We ran in. We ducked into the boarding house. Oh, this, this is cute. This is clever. Inside the boarding house, we slip behind a curtain and peer out at the street. We see Robin Avis stop for a few moments, and then he goes into a tea room opposite and sits in the windows keeping an eye on the boarding house. We best go out a different way, lads, says Wiggins. We walk past a puzzled cleaner and out a back door into a yard. Leaping over a small wall, we find ourselves in Clarges Street and head off to continue our investigations. Circle the letter V. So... So we went to his house. We're like, is this yours? He's like, if you, he's like, okay, you stole it. He think he knows we stole it. He thinks we're the people who stole it from him. And he's like, give it back. I'll give you some money. And he tries to grab it. We run. We duck into a boarding house, right? He's following us. He sees we went in. He sits across at a tea room watching the boarding house, waiting for us to come out. We've snuck out the back, and now we've got V, and it's suggested now that maybe we can sneak back into his house while he's watching us. That's what the V is. So I think what it's telling us to do is to go back to 27. I think this is the game part of it. So we, we're now going to circle back around to this guard's house, while he's sitting outside waiting for us. So we ducked out from him in there. Now he's waiting for us. We knocked on his door. He chased us. We ducked into a boarding house. He's sitting outside watching the windows, watching for us to come back out so he can grab us. We're circling out and we're gonna circle back to his house at 27 Northwest again. Okay, is everyone following that? If you have circled V, skip straight ahead. So we skip straight ahead. So now we're reading this. Robin, only read if you have V. Robin Avis' house appears to be empty. That's right, because he's waiting for us. And we assume he is still in the tea shop opposite the boarding house. We all look at the open window to the side of the door. Shall we, lads? Whispers Wiggins. If you want to enter the house, read the section below. If you do not want to enter, leave and go elsewhere. Okay, so we've got a question that of a type that we've not yet seen before in these games, in the Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. We've got an optional paragraph to read. Do we want to break into this guy's house or not? And it just says, if you don't want to, don't read this paragraph. So, very interesting. Well, clearly we're going to break in. We know this guy's bad. We know he's a bad guy. We're little street urchins. The worst that's going to happen to us, we're going to get slapped on the wrist. Holmes will pull some, pull some weight and get us out. So there's no real risk for us. It reminds me often now as an adult, when I see some like, like some abandoned or some, like let's say we go, we're on a bicycle ride and we come across some building in the out in the middle of nowhere that's like locked and it's like, it's a, it's like a government building or something. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is I'm really curious to like, Get in there and I think, wow, 
I wish someone had told me when I was like 16 or 15 or 16, like, you can do, you can do illegal stuff when you're that age. Like, your first couple are free. Like, you'll get arrested, it gets expunged from your record, they'll be leaning on you. Like, when you're, when you're under age, you've got, like, until they catch you and start to process you in the system, you got a couple free, you got a free catch and release. You might as well live dangerously, but not immorally. But I mean, you know, you could take some chances that you can't. When you're an adult, if you get arrested doing something, you know, that could be it. You could be, you could be in jail. All right, shall we break in here? Okay, if you want to enter the house, read the section below. If you do not want to enter, leave and go elsewhere. Okay, so we're in uh, 27, all right, back to this house, 27 Northwest. And we're breaking in, which is page nine. I'm writing that down because there's a little thing. We creep into the garden and Simpson glances around to check no one is watching. Then we hop through the window. We all follow and find ourselves in a small study. Let's be quick, says Wiggins. He could be back any time. We set about searching the house for anything relevant to our case. In a drawer in the hallway, Tinker finds two handwritten notes. One says, Meet at the Gross at the Grossavenors Hotel at 5 p.m. Bring shift schedules and a list of who has the keys you will need to obtain. The second note, which looks like the same handwriting, says, there is a new plan. Meet me at the usual place Wednesday, 8 p.m. So let's take a look at those. Let's let you take a look at those. Meet at the Grunsonson's Hotel at 5 p.m. Bring the shift schedule and a list of who has the keys you will need to obtain. There is a new plan. Meet me at the usual place Wednesday, 8 p.m. So, um, today is Friday. Thursday is when the murder happened. Wednesday or Thursday. Um, okay, well, let's write down these clues. It actually continues. Suddenly, we hear steps on the path. Throwing the notes back into the drawer, we run to the open window. As soon as we hear the front door close, we jump through and head back onto the street with Avis none the wiser. Circle the letter C. Okay, so we've got these C circled now. All right, let's write down this information. I'm going to make a note that it's on page nine in case we want to come back. But um, it's not clear which note came first, but there's a new plan. Meet me at the usual place Wednesday, 8 p.m. Another one is meet at Grosvenor's Hotel at 5 p.m. Bring shift schedules and a list of who has the keys we will need to obtain. So, bring the shift schedules on a list of who has the keys we will need to obtain. So, this is a note that's been delivered to our guard, who's obviously in on the plan. But now it's clear there's another person. It's not the guard is not the person. The guard is working with someone else. And this someone else has written him some notes and some nice handwriting. And it seems to be saying, get the shift schedules, who has the keys. It's not the keys to the cemetery. So I'm thinking it's the keys to like go and kill this guy. <laughs> go and kill this prisoner um, and cut off his finger. List of 
the keys you will need to obtain. Who has the keys you will need to obtain? So I'm thinking it's keys to get, get at him in his cell. And then there's new plan, meet me at the usual place, Wednesday at 8 p.m. So maybe like the guy sends, like the, the guy sends a note and says, we're going to have to move now. Or, well, we have no evidence that anything was happening with this cemetery. So we don't have any evidence that they had to move right away. But whatever it is, they decided they were going to meet. Usual place. So again, Groveson's Hotel. Groves, Gro it's not Governor's. It's Ghost. Ghost Fanon's Hotel. So let's write down these clues. So, Rosenfer's Hotel. We don't know what the day that is. We don't know at 5 p.m. what day, we don't know. And then there's an 8 p.m., which we do know the day, which is Wednesday which is two days before our case, so the 15th. Okay. And we got to see. So is this a good time to look at this newspaper again? Colin White was set upon by two men walking through Regent's Park. Again, two men... And then our guy got, remember the nurse said she was looking out the window. This is very early in the case. She saw it, said she saw two men rifling through a bag. So our guard was involved in this, killed the guy, cut off his finger, went to the cemetery to get the pearl. Whether he got it or not, we don't know. But he was robbed by these two robbers who just stumbled upon him. And they're committing these serial robberies. They robbed him, they took the stuff across the bridge, the satchel, they went looking through it to see what they got, they found the finger, they threw it in the, in the river. What we don't know, it seems like the big missing piece of this puzzle of import to us would be who is this partner who's writing these notes with these nice handwriting and who's sort of the mastermind behind this. Is it going to be Moriarty again? We don't know if the pearl was found. It's not important for us. But secondary questions we might have to answer is who are these two robbers? Like we might be able to track them down here as a secondary thing. It's not a prison break. The comment says, is it a prison break? No, they killed the guy in prison who had who had the address of where it was buried. They killed him, took his finger, and they were going to go dig it up. Then they got robbed before they had a chance. Hmm. Remember I just said, did they get him before or after he got the pearl? But we know they got him, they robbed him before because he was really interested in getting back that finger and satchel. So we know he hasn't dug it up yet. So that pearl is still in that grave. So we're gonna get it. We're gonna recover that pearl and get a reward or something or keep it for ourselves. Um, well, I mean, going to the hotel is definitely a great lead. Maybe they're gonna recognize someone. The, our, our mystery partner showed up in that hotel. And we don't think the police guard by the name of R.A. is involved now. We think that's a red herring. Okay, let's find this hotel. Let's see if anyone recognizes them in this hotel. So here's our hotels. And there's the Grosvenor Hotel. Now, that's probably a real hotel in London. If you looked up the history, you'd probably find that that belongs to some wealthy family called Grosvenor. That's got to be a name, right? Someone wants to look that up and tell us. But 69 Southwest. 69 Southwest is the location of that hotel. I'm assuming when they said meet at our regular location, that's there. But we can't assume it. But 
probably. 69 Southwest. Okay. Let's put a marker at 69 Southwest. Southwest numbers are a little all over the place. It's probably going to be some red one, right? There it is. Gross Fenor Hotel. Southwest London. Okay. Well, let's do it. Sixty nine Southwest. Do you have a circled C? Yes, we do. That's why we got this information. If you do, read on. The clerk at the Grosvenor tells you tells us that a short woman, rather elegant, in a green coat, met a bald man in the lobby bar on Wednesday evening at eight PM. He thinks he has seen them meet numerous times over the past few months but he cannot remember exactly when. A poorly matched couple, I dare say. Okay, so remember his cellmate said it was a woman by the way he was talking to her. Um, and it is a woman. So a the description is a short, elegant, handwriting was pretty elegant too, Short, elegant woman in a green coat. Well, I wonder if we should start looking at uh, clothing shops that might recognize a green coat is kind of unusual. So Wednesday at 8, and that this is their regular place. Okay. And we're going to write down here that we went to 69 Southwest Grosvenor. Or, sorry, I keep mispronouncing that. So, pacing. Pacing of these games is, of all these detective games is has to be done well to make them satisfying where new leads come out regularly. So we've got this hint. We now have narrowed things down a little, like we're closing in on this woman. Who is this woman? Now, a good uh, logical thing to do would be to talk to the detective of the case who handled this burglar and say, you know, what was what were his known associates? Who is this woman? But we already did that. And he didn't say anything about known associates, right? That was, um, that was at Scotland Yard. Let's just take a look at this again, 13SW, to remind ourselves what he said about... Um, Do any policemen have R.A. Robert Angel? Okay. Uh, he climbed. We saw him. Did Stern work alone? No. We were sure there was someone helping him plan the burglaries, but never found out who. So. Here's a game issue, depending on how you like to play these games. Like we're gonna, we're gonna chase down every lead to find out who this woman was. But if you were playing this game and you were just like, eh, you know, it's the end of the evening, let's just try to solve it. We don't know who that woman is, but we know most of it. And you could do it that way. You could say, okay, we know enough. We're gonna try to answer the questions. We know we're not gonna get a perfect score. And you could end the game here. If you wanted to end here, you could end here. We know a lot about what happened. Um, but that's not the way we're playing it. We're going to play it where we're going to 
sit here. Now, this is one of the problems with um, doing these live streams. Greg and I have played games where we were like, okay, we'll meet again tomorrow. And, you know, I filled up a whiteboard with clues and spent two days staring at it. That we cannot do on the live stream. So there's only so much that time we could spend sit here sitting here not talking and think so we're gonna have to try to walk it walk it forward and hopefully have something new to open up if we had to we would chase down some tailor and the clothing store and see if we can't get her identified that way can anyone remember any other information that would help us track down who this woman partner is. So the cop says someone else was helping set up the robberies. Given what we were what we were heard about the jailhouse conversations, what we understand is that he was partners with this woman. He committed this robbery. He was almost caught, so he hid it. He went to jail, and then he was talking to his woman partner and saying, Don't worry. I hid it outside before I get caught. I'm not going to tell you where because you'll just go get it. But I have tattooed it on my finger so it's safe. Then she set up this whole double cross, had the bad guard in on it. They killed him, took his finger. So this woman is sort of the mastermind behind all this. And she, she actually had her partner killed. So we know she's not going to be related to him. But, and we don't know why she had him killed. Oh, okay. Well, she had him killed right away. Like, he wasn't in, he wasn't in jail for very long. She was seen at the Grosvenor Hotel. If we look at the notes, they were sort of elegant, like written by a woman. He did the uh, Grosvenor Hotel. Where's the key who will need? This is a new plan. Meet me at the usual place at 8 p.m. Short woman, elegant, helping him in lots of robberies. Look at the newspaper again to see if there's anything about. Um, I'm just thinking, like, is she some elegant? Is she somewhere in royalty? She's not going to be the guy's wife, P P Peabody, or whatever the guy who got robbed. Uh, yeah, the 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 ward that got robbed. It's. If she's involved in multiple burglaries, there'd be no reason for her to be involved in that. It's not Gladys, right? <laughs> the cemetery woman. Um... Mr. Ernest Tafson, a draper who lives on the west end of Bloomsbury Way, summoned for causing willful damage to property on that same street. A draper. Is a draper the person who dresses people? I'm just reading the story about the vandalism. Case against a defendant said there was a reason he was assaulting the property. The lady of the house had insulted him and her husband had made inappropriate comments to Mr. Tafson's daughter. Mr. Marshall responded, even if such events had occurred, they were not justification. Hmm. I mean doesn't seem like there'd be any reason they're related unless there's some connection. 
we could go check that unrelated robbery just to just to tie down those loose ends of the secondary stuff. It would be nice if this newspaper had a story about a woman in a green coat. And we know the connection to the Greek stuff is all, I mean, it's just a random, there's only, the only reason there's Greek involved is because he buried it randomly under a Greek grave in the large Greek section of the cemetery that he was running through. I do not see anything more about an elegant woman. Okay, well we we've got a we've got a side quest thing about the other robbery, but I'd like to track down that woman. So London Society gossip Underworld, I mean if she's a mastermind of this, maybe the underworld guy might know something about it. And then the other thing would be if we could track her down by her coat. It wasn't like a super distinctive coat, just a green coat, but she was short and elegant. That might be enough to identify her if we went to the, the coat guy. Let's see what we've got by way of um, Didn't say it was fur, did it? Green, that's not gonna be fur. Department stores. Hmm. So, okay, here's an idea. Here's an idea for you. Our theory is that Okay, well, I mean, let's back this up. My theory was that he was killed to get his finger. And the prison just thought it was a heart attack. If that's true, then someone fairly sophisticated killed him and made it look like a heart attack. That's possibility A. If that's the case, we might be looking for how did someone poison him and make it look like a heart attack. Theory B is that we that it's a slightly different understanding of the, the chain of events. That what happened was he did die of a heart attack. The prison was only going to hold him and cremate him for one day. And so they had to quickly get in there, cut off his finger, and get out. And they didn't kill him. He died of his own. What I was going to say, if it's case A or B... In either, either way, it would be nice to look at the autopsy of that prisoner. Now, in the beginning, we were like, well, there's no point in going... When we found the finger, we are like, there's no point in going to the, uh, the guy who does autopsies because there's no body. But now we know there was a body. It was the body at the jail. Now, did they do an autopsy on it? What's... Let's check out the medical examiner and see if he did an autopsy on this body. I forget whether the jailer said, but let's, let's, let's stop by and see. Because I'd love to know whether that prisoner was poisoned and killed to make it look like a heart attack or whether he actually had a heart attack. And this seems like it would be the way to find out. So 38 EC. 38 EC. We went here last time. Should be red, right? Thirty-eight EC. I should know where this is. There it is, Saint Bartholomew's Hospital. 
right there. All right, so let's go there. Let's go to 38 EC and see if this guy happened to do an autopsy on our guy, on our prisoner. East, southwest, northwest, DC. 38 EC. Have any fingers gone missing recently? Wiggins asks J Jasper Meeks. No, Meeks replies. It would be very careless of me to lose a body part, even if it wasn't my own. And have you had any bodies come in with missing fingers or with distinctive tattoos? Sorry. Nothing like that has come my way in a good few weeks. We open the tin and ask Jasper if he can tell us anything about the finger. I doubt I can add much to what Dr. Watson told you, he says, studying it with a magnifying glass, except to say the person it belonged to probably died within the last few days. Okay. So didn't autopsy him. It's not clear whether he died of a heart attack. Should we... Should we check what the prison said again about him dying there? 23 SW. I mean, it would be nice to know if they snuck in and killed him or if he died. Um, yesterday, someone cut off a finger of his corpse, one of our prisoners who died on Wednesday. He was cremated. We do not have the facility. Found dead in his room Wednesday morning. The prison doctor said it was a heart attack. Okay. The note we found said was from Wednesday. There is a new plan. Meet me at the usual place. So let's adjust our hypothesis for a second and say that they didn't go kill him. There was no rush to kill him. He had a heart attack. Then they had to change plans and be like, we need to get in there right away, Check, find that body, get that address, get that information on his finger. Um, doesn't help us though. Doesn't help us to know who that woman is so any theories about what would be the best way to find that woman i looked up i mean i could look up the tailor she is short maybe she had to have that jacket that coat adjusted or we could look up the underworld she seems like she's kind of a mastermind so i wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't know something about the woman in green um Ones in society gossip. All right, I'm inclined. Let me look up Taylor's here for a second. I always like it's always satisfying to find information by looking up a category rather than go to an informant. So there's four Taylor's. I don't know where this woman is, but she is meeting him here. So let's assume that maybe she lives around here, if this is where she's meeting. So Southwest, are there any tower tailors in the Southwest? No. There's some Northwest tailors. There's some Southeast tailors. Northwest and Southeast. Um, let's try going to the two tailors here. And just for the hell of it, in case we can track, track her down. So I'm going to write down the four tailors, but we're not going to go to all of them till we get desperate. But we will go to the two closest ones. Okay, the two closest ones would be C. 
16 Northwest, which is not that close. And 88 Southeast, which is again, not very close to where she wants to meet. And there's an 11 West Central. The cat looks like it's going to want to make a jump for this table, but hopefully it got, got thought, thought better of it. 11 West Central. Where's 11 West Central? I don't think this tailor is going to be anything. Do you ever go to a tailor for a coat? You have to need to get it sh shortened, right? You're a short woman and you're elegant and you're rich unless there's some other name for that uh, where's 11 West Central it's going to be around here somewhere there's 11 West Central and then 10 East Central boy these just seem like they would be such long shots. For the sake of not brute forcing things, I don't think we're going to let us let ourselves look at all these. Well, unless we um, there's the metro Metropolitan Hotel. Did we hear something about the Metropolitan Hotel? Maybe in the newspaper somewhere. There's a tower in the Metropolitan Hotel. Princess Christian. This is a property damage thing. China Tea Cups. It's all very intriguing. Um, last time we We've missed something in the newspaper, so I'm keen not to have that happen again. I don't see anything though. We'll come back to it though. All right, let's let's just look up a couple of these. Tailors to see 16 Northwest seems unlikely, but no 16 Northwest. I guess we should be writing this down if we want to punish ourselves for wasting time. Um, there was a southeast one that was this. 88 Southeast, okay. This is the last one I'm gonna look for if it's not there. No, okay. 88 Southeast. Um. So I'm just looking through these categories and I do notice there are some jewelers. Would you talk to a jeweler if you were trying to fence or find out how much something was worth? I mean, it's a long shot. Or a pawnbroker. But not if you don't have it yet, right? You go after you get it, I would think. All right, well, let's take these off. 
they're still written down if they wanted to remember i'll put these we do go to two so i'll put these over here all right let's go to the underworld person and see if they have heard of this green coated woman porky shinwell owner of the raven and rat pub at 52 ec so 52 ec all the way up there all right let's go to 52 ec and see what Porky has to say. If you're in the comments making notes, try to find out what we where we would find that woman. Do you have a circle W? We do. If so, skip to the last section of this entry, which begins only read this if you have a circle W. We ask Porky about Stern. Oh yeah, he says. I knew him before he got banged up. Word on the street was that he had an accomplice who's been planning to break him out. It's too late now, of course. The blighter's dead. If you haven't read the first section, go read it now. Okay, so that's why that note said there's been a change of plan. They were going to break him out. He died by accident, had a real heart attack, change of plan. We got to go get that finger. All right. Have you heard anything about anyone cutting off fingers? Asks Wiggins. Nah, mate, Porky replies. Nothing's, nothing particular comes to mind. What about any crimes that happened last night? There was an assault on a young man in Regent's Park, but I don't know much about it. Porky thinks for a moment. Actually... You're the second person to ask me about last night. A woman came in at midday. A short lady in a green wool coat. I recognized her, but I don't know her name. She was trying to find two men who were responsible for a mugging on Lower Belgrave Street outside the Spanish Embassy at 9 p.m. last night. Lower Belgrave, Spanish Embassy. So it's going to be in here somewhere, right? And then they ran across the bridge. I had no idea who they were, which is true. Porky shouts over to a scrawny old woman sitting next to the door. Oi, Isabel. You said you knew that woman who was in here earlier, didn't you? What? shouts out Isabel. That woman! shouts Porky. What? shouts Isabel. Midday! shouts Porky. What? shouts Isabel. Come here! shouts Porky, gesturing Isabel. Isabel ambles over. The woman who was here earlier. Who was she? Think her given name is Claire or Clara. She lives in a posh end of town. Twixt Belgrave Square and Buckingham Palace Gardens. Thanks, Porky, says Simpson. We head for the exit and Wiggins turns back to shout, And thanks, Isabel. As the door closes, we hear Isabel shout, What? Circle the letter B. So that was... That was awesome. That was good detective work that we knew the underground guy might have heard about this woman. And she... It's cool. It makes sense. Like she's now trying to track down these random robbers that cross paths with our guard, with our bad guard. So she was in there chasing down leads before us, trying to, to catch up with the two robbers. Okay. And she cracked our case wide open. Isabel did. Because at 52 EC, which we just went to here, which we're going to make a note of. 52 EC, she gave us a name. Claire or Clara. No last name. But she leaves, lives between Belgrave Square and Buckingham Palace.
Clara, Clara, no last name though. So we're not going to be able to look her up. But let's see, Belgrave Square and Buckingham Palace. Let's see if we can find those locations and see where she lives. Let's find Buckingham Palace. She lives in the posh part of town. Yeah, because she's getting rich from all these robberies. Buckingham Palace, 35 Southwest. Thirty-five Southwest. Let's take a look here. Thirty-five Southwest. There's Buckingham Palace. And he she Isabel said she lives between Belgrave Square and Buckingham Palace. So do you see Belgrave Square? There's the Spanish Embassy where the robbery occurred. And there's the hotel. That makes sense that why she wanted to meet at the hotel. Let's see. I don't see Belgrave Square on a coarse look at that. Let's see if it's in the directory somewhere, though. It's not in there known as Belgrave Square. Do you think it's a park? It would be listed under parks? No. Well, let's see. Um, there's Belgrave Square right there. Okay, so she lives somewhere between here and here. There aren't that many places. Let's see what we've got here. I mean, assuming she doesn't live in one of those, we've got more places she could live. Fifty two EC. She lives in a posh end of town betwixt Belgrave Square and Buckingham Palace. Oh, Buckingham Palace Gardens, which is there. Boy, that looks like fifty six or fifty five to me. It'd be nice to have a reverse lookup, like, um, was it Ellery Queen that had a reverse lookup? So you could say, like, what is it, 56? Like, is there any, it's not red, so it's not a place, so maybe it's a private residence, I don't know. But it could be a shop, too. Like, it would be nice to know if there was a hotel at 56. Southwest. Don't see any hotel. Uh, in... Let's look up 56 and 55. Let's knock on some doors and see if we can't find this person. Let's make a note here. Maybe 56 Southwest or 55 Southwest. Okay, so I'm going to start at 55 Southwest. Let's just knock on a door. Knock, 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 nothing at 55. So we're going to mark it that we did 55. Nothing there. Okay, let's knock on 56. Knock, knock, knock. No one appears to be home at number 56. So we peer through the window in the door. On the sideboard, we can see some letters addressed to a Claire Poole. And we can just make out part of a note sticking out of a letter rack that says, Plan is off, he is dead. And then it cuts off. 
Plan is off. He is D-E. And then I don't know why she didn't finish writing it. Claire Poole. Claire Poole at 56 Southwest. Um, well, we know who it is now. We know it's the mastermind. She's not home. We can take these off and mark our 56 Southwest. We didn't go to those, but we went to this one. Well, we've got our mastermind. Uh, we don't know anything about her. We could look her up. We could look up in the newspaper in case she's referenced, but I mean, theoretically, if we look up Poole, that should give us her address. It's not going to give us any additional address for her, surely. Uh, that's interesting. So there's no Claire Poole, but there is Poole and Company, 10 EC. This is all the way over here. Who is not that common a name? Oh, it's at the Metropolitan Hotel. That was where the tailor was that we didn't visit. That's interesting. Shall we pay a visit to 10 EC? Pool and Company, Taylor? Is, is that what it is? Is she, is she a tailor? Is that what it is? Pool and Company, she's a tailor. Claire Pool is a tailor. That's why she was wearing an unusual coat. It's cool that that was a tailor we didn't visit because it was so far away, but now we're gonna make a visit. This is exciting. Shall we take a little five minute break? Let's take a five minute break before we go talk to Claire Pool, and we will be back in five minutes.
Welcome back. You're watching Co-op for Two. We've just had our last break. I think we're almost ready to tie this thing into a bow. We, when we broke, we had just found the place where the woman lives, the mastermind, found her name, looked up. She doesn't have a residence entry, but we did find an entry for a company called Pool and Company which struck a bell, the location struck a bell at the Met in the Metropolitan Hotel. Turns out, Pool and Company was one of the tailors that we put on our short list to look, to visit. We visited two of the tailors because of her green coat. We thought, well, she's short, green coat. But now it turns out she's owner of this tailor shop. So now we're gonna go pay her a visit and see what she has to say for herself at the Metropolitan Hotel 10 EC. Kind of exciting. We need a, uh, we need to take a look at. There's the Metropolitan Hotel right there. So we're walking over there. This whole bunch of scruffy little kids barging right into the tailor shop. Let's see what she has to say for herself. EC, there's no entry for it. Okay. That's all right. We know we know what's going on. We can't we can't go in there. 10 EC. I really did want to go in there and confront her. Is there really no entry at 10 EC? Can that really be? 10 EC. Yeah, no, no entry. 10 EC. Dave Neal, shame on you for not writing in an entry at 10 EC. Shame on you. All right. We don't get to confront her. Well, we knock on the door, it's closed. We still know who she is and what she's all about. Okay. Um, we could call it, we could try to solve it now. We'll, I'll sum up in a minute what we, what our hypothesis is. But we have two tiny little loose ends. One is this robbery that has happened. Uh, and I think we owe it to ourselves to track down. I think we're just going to find that if we, we might get some information about these robbers who robbed our guy of his satchel. It doesn't seem like it's very important to our case, but um, I think, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound, we might as well tie up these loose ends in case some of the questions ask us like, who are the robbers of the satchel? 97 Northwest, let's go, 97 Northwest. There's no 97 Northwest, okay. Did we understand that correctly? Assault in Regents Park. Encouraged to speak to Inspector Lestrade. Huh. Let's, let's look at Lestrade again. Let's see what he said about that case. 13 Southwest. Um, there was an assault in an isolated spot in Regents Park. The victim was a young man named Colin White. Okay. He is now in Middlesex Hospital. So, Colin White. We could look up his home information, but it sounds like he's saying is in Middlesex Hospital. So... We would be penalized a turn, but not a location because there was nothing there, essentially, if you cared about scores. Okay, so Middlesex Hospital, is that nearby? Or do we have to look it up? I guess we have to look it up. Ten. 
10 Northwest of Middlesex Hospital. I like how they bring them to places nearby, you know? Like, I like that she lived here, so that's where she organized a meeting. This one seems a little more spread out. Okay, 10 Northwest. Let's visit Colin in the hospital and see what he has to say, even though we don't really care. 10 Northwest. The staff at Middlesex Hospital say that no fingers have gone missing from patients or corpses. Do you have R circled? We do. If, if not, go elsewhere. If you do, read on. We say we work for Inspector Lestrade and ask to see Colin White to check a few more details about the attack. A nurse shows us to his room. As we approach, a tall, dark-haired lady emerges. She has bright red lipstick and looks to be in her mid-30s. She walks past us and towards the hospital exit. Tall, dark-haired lady. Whoa. What did we hear about a tall, dark-haired lady? Bright red lipstick and looks to be in her mid-30s. She walks past us and towards the hospital exit. Colin White is lying in bed, bandaged and bruised, looking very dejected. One of his eyes is swollen and his cheek is bruised, but we can tell that under normal circumstances he would be a handsome young man. Hello, Colin, says Wiggins. We're trying to catch the people who did this to you. Can you tell us what happened? It was attacked, that's all, says Colin. As I told the inspector, I didn't see who by. What were you doing in Regent's Park? Ugh, just walking home from work. I always go through the park. It's quicker. And where do you work? Todd and Son Butchers. What time are you attacked? Must have been, must have been about 6.30. So it was still light, says Tinker. But you didn't see your attackers? No. They had their faces covered. Two men. That's all I know. There's nothing to be done. I just need to be left alone to recover so I can go back to work. You better leave, says the nurse. He needs his rest. Very well, ma'am, says Wiggins, and we head outside. Circle the letter E. Oh, that was weird. Got a little side mystery going on. Who is this dark-haired woman? So he's handsome. So we circled E, right? He is handsome. And she is tall, dark. What else did it say about her? Middlesex Hospital, which was 10. Northwest. Bright red lipstick. Tall, tall, dark hair, mid thirties, Regent's Park, walking home from work, I go through the park, it's quicker. Where do you work? Todd and Son Butcher. This is going to be something in the newspaper about this little side case. 6.30 p.m., which the only thing that's important about that is it was still light out. He's lying about something. All right, let's find Todd and Son Butchers, and then let's see if we can look him up and see where he lives. Todd's not in their directory, but I believe there is a directory for markets and butchers. There's markets, including a meat market, but Todd and Son is not in it. Well, that's frustrating. But Regent's Park, how is Regent's Park between anything? Like, what on earth? All right, let's try to look him up, Colin White. Uh, 
It's not even in the directory. Colin White is not even in the directory. It's just Tim North West. Let's just record that we've been there. Well, I mean, I know we wrapped up our main case, but it feels like we've got a little side case that is confusing. I'll bet there's something in the newspaper about this. She's like the actress or performance. So. Madame Tussauds, Marley Bones Work, Bedford Women's College. Trying to see what's around Regent's Park that he might have really been going for. Um, Todd and Sons Butcher, and yet we didn't see any Butcher. We don't know where that is. It's not, why is it not in the directory? Why is it not in the directory under markets? Well, settle in, guys. If this takes us another two hours, we're, we're still in for it. We're not going to be quitting this early without wrapping this up. Um, so... White, Colin White with W H Y T. I mean, I'll look up White. Let's see if so. There's no White. Let's read the newspaper article. A young man named Colin White was set upon last night by two men while walking through Regent's Park. Sufficient to put him in hospital, nothing was stolen. The motive for the attack, apparently unprovoked, is not known. Anyone witness to it, talk to the police. We talked to the police. He said the guy is not admitting what they would have stolen. I mean, it seems totally unrelated to our case, right? It's just it's the same two men. We don't know who this dark-haired woman is. In her 30s. Tall, with lipstick. Jack Whitaker, a veterinarian, gave evidence to Mr. Ernest Tassin, a draper. This is the thing where someone said he said bad things about her daughter. Princess laid the stone. Princess Christian paid a visit to Kenseltown for the purpose of laying a foundation stone dedicated to St. Thomas, East Row and Kensal Road. I'm just trying to see if that was, if that happens to be near Regent's Park. Mention of Piccadilly um, 
hotel. Two revolvers. Well, let's pick a deli hotel. I know we came across it somewhere. It's here. It's right next to what? What was it? 63. Got a note here about it, but I can't read it. What did we do down here at 63? Oh, that was where the guy lived. This is where we ch he chased us and we circled back down. So this newspaper article talks about Murder, uh, was it the murder one or was it the, uh, employed at the Piccadilly, this is the murder, I was just, the only reason I was drawn to it is because I don't really understand this mur this murder case. The prisoner who was married man and the woman who was found dead, who was a barmaid. After the ceremony, so bigamously married. So he marries when he's already married. They went through the marriage then they quickly bought two revolvers. They saw them together in Archbishop's Park on May 20th, and the deceased was found shot shortly afterwards. They found him. He wrote a note to his wife saying he's about to die. The woman's death was due to suicide. There was no evidence of any agreement to commit suicide upon which charge. That's weird. All right, I'm going to stop off at the Piccadilly Hotel just because it's so near to our other stuff. I'm, I don't want to see if there's information about that that case. I'm not. I'm sort of shooting in the dark here. Twenty six Northwest. No, there's no twenty six Northwest. All right. What is going on with our guy, Colin White? Who gets beat up, taken to the hospital, claims nothing was stolen, and some dark-haired actress is seen leaving his room. I mean, it was our assumption that it's just an unrelated robbery that we don't have to know anything about. But let's go see what he said again. Colin White was at the hospital, 10 Northwest. Few more details about the attack and nurse shows us rumors. a tall dark haired lady emerges she has bright red lipstick and looks to be in her mid 30s she walks past us towards the exit he's all bruised up i was attacked that's all as i told the inspector what were you doing just walking home from work so we notice him he's very handsome and he's saying he works at the butcher shop todd and son butchers 
They had their face covered. And then we circled a letter, which really suggests to us that there's something for us to uncover. Okay, so here's my thinking. We couldn't find Todd and Son. We couldn't find his work. I don't know what he's doing in the park. But if he is an actor and she is an actress or performer, then we may have an informant who might be able to help us. So a social columnist knows all London society gossip. And we could take to the talk to the newspaper guy. So I think we should go to, to one of those. So to Southwest, the London Society gossip, I'm tempted to go to first. To Southwest. And then maybe a reporter for the newspaper who might know more about that. Like we talked to the police about the robbery. He may have sniffed out some information. 30 EC. So let's try to find out what Colin White is hiding and who this woman is. Okay, so to Southwest. Is everyone okay with that? And there's a little marker here for that police officer with the name R.A. Okay, to Southwest. Let's see if we got something. Do you have a circled N? Yes, we do. I don't know a lot about Lord Peaford, says Langdale, or the Arabelli Pearl. The pearl is incredibly valuable, and I think he purchased it for his daughter Beatrice. Lord Peaford is a large fellow and a bit shy. That's all I can tell you, I'm afraid. Um, well, who is... Do you think Beatrice could be that dark-haired woman who's, like, trying to find her pearl? Who is Beatrice? I want, I mean, not who is Beatrice, but I wonder. That was two Southwest. Beatrice P. P. Ford? P. Ford. Southwest. Okay, let's mark that with a green. That was the social columnist. Langdale Pike. Yeah, he was not that useful. Let's look up Peaford again. What do we know about this Peaford guy? I think he's off the map. Right? Like his place that got robbed wasn't even in the thing and I didn't see any Beatrice um, let's go to the newspaper guy 30 EC Thirty EC. Have you heard anything about a missing finger? We asked Henry Ellis at the Times office. No, nope, but I'm intrigued. Replies Ellis. Whose finger is it? Wish we knew, said Wiggins. We don't. We do know. Well, it sounds like a good story. I did once hear of some medical students doing something similar as a prank. He says. Anything else interesting come your way? Recently, asked Simpson. One of my reporters found a witness who saw two men acting suspiciously in the area where Colin White was attacked. Apparently one of them had a tattoo. What kind of tattoo? I'm afraid the investigating reporter is out at the moment, but I think he said something about the Garden of Eden. That's weird. Um, 
When was this attack set upon last night? And one of them had a tattoo. That's got to be a red herring, right? I was thinking it's Colin White. One of the criminals? No. Um, so this was 30 EC. And he says, found a witness who saw two men acting suspiciously in the area where Colin White was attacked. One of them had a tattoo. I think that's just a red herring. Something about the Garden of Eden. Okay, well, we do have this flower show at the Royal Horticultural Society. Horstmeyer. Garden of Eden, huh? Let's replace our 30 EC. Let's see if there's any Garden of Eden thing in the thing here. Don't see any Garden of Eden. Let's look if there, if there's a forest. Forest. No. No Garden of Eden. What are we missing? Read that again. 30 EC. This one right here, Garden of Eden. Um, found a witness who saw two men, Garden of Eden, Garden of Eden, what is that relevant to, Garden of Eden, well, let's see if there's some gardens, I mean, we do have that flower society show, which I'm tempted to look at. But is there any, let's, part, uh, well, wait a second. There was, she did work at Buckingham Palace Gardens. Is it possible that Colin White So I'm just trying to think, like, is it possible that we were thinking that two men who robbed Colin White, just as a coincidence, then robbed our guy? Is it possible that we're not paying close enough attention to the timeline and that Colin White was one of the robbers of our guy? And so they tracked him down to beat him up to get him to tell them where the satchel is. So does that make sense for timeline? The Salt at Regents Park set upon last night Put him in the hospital. So that would be Thursday night is Colin White. Thursday night is Colin White, right? And then our guy when was the We went to the hospital, which was 29, I'm trying to get the timeline a little better, 29 Southwest. That's when she said she saw stuff. 20, 29 Southwest. 
Well, I know there's an entry for that, so why am I not seeing it? What am I doing wrong? That's not southwest, southeast. Okay. All right, guys, I thought we had wrapped this up. Twenty nine southeast. Okay. Um, I was on night duty. So this is Friday, right? And we ask if anything, because this is our this is Friday case. Our case starting on Friday. I was on night duty. So two men come running over the bridge just before nine thirty p.m. Thursday, 9.30 is the robbers throw the finger into the lake. And Collins happens at 6.30. So Collins is assaulted before the robbers even get to our finger. So it sounds to me like they're unrelated. Boy, something doesn't feel right about that though. Who else could we ask about that woman? We could go to Sherlock Holmes and see if he has any hint for us. We might have to. Old criminal records. Old criminal records. We might have to see if we can trace anyone down. I feel like most of what we're going to get now is just going to reinforce what we already know. It's just a matter of, do we want to try to solve this right now without understanding what happened with Colin White? Garden of Eden, huh? Let's look at this newspaper article about this flower show. Thursday at the Royal Horticultural Society. Royal Horticultural Society. Just sort of shooting in the dark to see if we can't. There's no Royal Horticultural Society, but there is a Royal Botanical Gardens. There is a charity section. There's a vegetarian society. Hmm. Garden of Eden. Garden of Eden. Well, I mean, there's the uh, Buckingham Palace Gardens right next to our house. We didn't actually go there. And then if we believe that the Royal Botanical Gardens is related, that's 98 Northwest. That is our place right near Regent's Park. Okay, well that's tempting then. The newspaper person said there someone found a witness in Garden of Eden and then the Royal Botanical Gardens is 98 right next to 
Regent's Park where the attack took place. So let's go 98 Northwest. Let's see if we can get a better witness to what happened. I'm not keeping very good track of all of our times here. That's all right. Surely 98 Northwest is here. Really? Really, guys? There's no 98 Northwest. There's nothing at... No, there's almost nothing at 98. There's nothing. There's nothing up there. Wow. That is confusing. That's awfully confusing that there's nothing up there. All right, let's check out the Buckingham Palace Gardens, 96 Southwest. Nope. There's no page missing here, right? Oh, okay. Okay, well, that's a little frustrating. Well, I, I, it's, there should be. Dave Neal, come on, guy. What are you doing to us? There was a whole stuff going on up there. Garden of Eden, and there's no entry for it? What's 99? There's more gardens there, 99. But I know from <laughs> trying to open this in the northwest that there's, there's no high numbers here anymore. Confusing. Very confusing. Come on, guys, in the comments, help me out here. What's the Royal Academy? What's the Royal Academy? Is it a theater? Like, I think, I keep thinking that maybe she's a actress, that dark-haired woman. But I'm not sure what the Royal Academy actually is. Royal Academy, 23 Northwest. The only thing, the only reason I'm, the only reason I was looking at it, why was I looking at it? Why was he walking through the park? Where's the Royal Academy? I don't know why I'm... There's a theater, theaters, theaters, princess theater. What was the deal with the princess? Princess Christian at Kenseltown. She got money. Hmm. Princess Christian paid a visit to Kenseltown. What is Kenseltown? The corner of East Row and Kensel Road. Do you think that 
that rob like that woman might have been the princess Like this is a little bit of a side mystery, but I feel like we're supposed to solve it. I think you see anything. Let's put you on top down as well. You can zoom in and help me here. Garden of Eden. Someone could look up Kenseltown, see if it's a known, is it outside London? Is this a story about something happening outside London that has nothing to do with us? If I look up Kenseltown, am I going to see anything? There's no en entry for Kensel. Why would he have been near the park? East Row on a site at East Row and Kensel Road. Yeah, I mean, I don't see those places here. Tricky. Let's go visit Sherlock Holmes. Let's see if he's got any information for us. He may give us hints on stuff we have no, we don't need any hints on, but let's see, maybe he's got some ability to tell us about stuff. We arrive at Baker Street to find Holmes on the step, unlocking the front door. Mr. Holmes, you're back, shouts Wiggins. Indeed I am, Wiggins, the detective replies, and glad to be. A most disappointing case. The lad had simply run away to irritate his parents, as was clear as day to anyone with an ounce of sense. Anyhow, I detect excitement in your gang. What is afoot? We open the tin and show Holmes the finger inside. Remarkable, he says. Well, clearly, whoever removed it wanted to keep it safe and preserved, which is why they used salt, so they would not have thrown it into the river. It could be that someone acquired it unintentionally and not knowing what to do with such a bizarre object, they discarded it. That's our thing. I would turn my attention immediately to the location where it was found to attempt to discover how it ended up there. Any items found with it could also be of interest. And as for the tattoo, I take it it's Greek lettering. If you have a circled B and a circled S, we do have a circled B and S. We show Holmes the satchel and the paper found inside and tell him what we learned at the Raven and Rat. Well, he says, perhaps whoever owned the bag was mugged and then discovering the finger, the mugger discarded in the Thames. I would look for a place where employees might work in shifts. And that is a 30 minute walk from the Spanish embassy and the compass directions on the patrol are suggestive. All right. All stuff we already knew of no help to us. Of no help to us. We don't care about that. We care about this side case. Do we have any other informants? All right, we're 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 grasping at straws now, but we're 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 more committed. It's just me now. Everyone else has gone to sleep. All right, let's go to the National Archives and see if we've got any more history about 
white or anything like that about this white guy. Seventeen WC. Do you have a circled N or a circled W? Yes, we've got both. Uh, if not, you learn nothing. Okay. At the land registry, we learn more about South Metropolitan Cemetery. 1836, founded by an act of parliament on land purchased from the late Lord Thurlow, overseen by the Diocese of Winchester. 1842, a section of the cemetery was set aside for use by London's Greek Orthodox community. This section was later enlarged. From 1877, overseen by the Diocese of Rochester. Okay, circle W. We find Walter Stern's file, born on 6 December 1946, to Arthur Patrick Stern and Phyllis Stern, now Halton. Arrested for burglary and ace. Let's just look up Halton in case. Uh, arrested for robbery and ace September after robbing the house of Lord Peaford in Lower Norwood, South London. The arresting officer was Inspector Wadlow of Scotland Yard, convicted of six charges of robbery on 2nd December 1884 and sentenced to 20 years in prison. Okay. No real help there. And if we're keeping track of our turns, this was another wasted time at the National Archives, 17 WC. I'm not sure I'm keeping track of any of this. Let's look up Halton, though. No. What was her... Uh, oh, yeah, it was his name. His name... Oh, hold on a second. Uh, that was... National Archives, 17 WC. Born to Phyllis Stern, now Halton. If we look up Stern, is there? I'm think I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out who that woman was at the hospital. I mean, she could have just been his wife, right? It would be cool if it was just a wild well, goose chase, but she's got with red lipstick like it sounds odd right like she's involved in some there's some side story and it's related to the newspaper I just know it I know Dave Neal is doing this to us again Colin White, beat up earlier. And then the same criminals rob our guy. Is it possible? And it's not a coincidence that somehow Colin White is involved in this and told them to go try to rob this guy. Orchestral Society. Jack Whitaker, a veterinarian, gave evidence. Uh, 
I was hurrying along Boonthray Way to attend an injured horse when I observed the prisoner projecting rocks and pieces of wood into one of the houses. So he's mad about someone saying bad things about his daughter. All right, let's follow up this little story and see if this has anything related to our case. Ernest Tafson. He's not in here, but he is a veterinarian. Where did we see veterinarian before? Was it a market? No. Ugh. Where did we see veterinarian? Charities, Veterinarian Society 38E. And maybe doctors, physicians. Draper. So, do we look up Whitaker? This would be a good time to use your fast forward in the YouTube if you're watching this not live. Jack Whitaker. Okay, let's look up Jack Whitaker at 89SE. 89SE. Like, totally unrelated to our case. But let's talk to this guy about this event. Jack Whitaker and see if there's any way to tie it together with our case. Not even our case. We're not even looking about our case now. We're looking about this other case. 29, oh, 89SC. Okay, 89SC. Do you have a circled N? If not, wait, that's wrong. That's 82. 89SC. He was a very agitated fellow. I remember that. The house he was attacking was number 74. I think someone said the owner was a medical man. Seventy-four. So we need the uh, Jack give evidence, Mr. Ernest Taffin Draper, who lives at the west end of Bloomsbury Way. So we want seventy-four Bloomsbury Way, and where uh, S E. Southeast, we think. Seventy four does not look like it's Bloomsbury Way. It's a little confusing. So there's eighty nine where he lives. And he says, the story is that this guy was hurrying along Bloomsbury Way. Doesn't matter where he lives. Where is Bloomsbury Way? It might be near his house, but maybe not. And he says 74. But it might not be in this location because I don't see a Bloomsbury Way here in 74. Um, let's look at the other 74s. Greg would be going crazy if I, well, we'd, we, would, we would be trying to solve it. Greg would, Greg, Greg would not put up with this. But we are here. It's just me, so we're going to take 
all the time that's needed. There's no rush. Right? There's no rush. No one's watching this. It's just me. If you're watching on YouTube, you just fast forward. This will give, give you the full experience. So 74 Old Street Last Street I don't see anything on that 74. Okay, well there's our 74 Bloomsbury Way. So it's not there, it's here. This is where this event happened. So let's look up 74 WC. Hasn't been much in WC at all. And let's see if there's anything related to our case. WC, that's not, it's not there. <laughs> Nothing. Uh, is it the Ernest Tafson? They're causing property or damage on that same street. And there's no Tafson. Okay, well that's confusing. Lives on the west end of Bloomsbury Way. Yeah. Thirty-seven. Seventy-four. The west end would be 37. I'm just going to look up 37 as my last thing to look up. No. Okay. WC. Well, uh, no, that's not. Looms very well, doesn't continue down. Okay. Well, then I'm at a loss. Garden of Eden, that was still our best clue, that Eden thing. There's no Eden. Well, that's a little frustrating. I'd love to have someone in the comments who had some theory. Zach says he's still here. Well, Zach, wh what, what's, how do we track down this, what happened to this guy? I mean, is it not important? Like, is it just a red herring that that woman with makeup, tall brown hair? I mean, I suppose, but it made a circle a letter. So it's, sorry, I should be switched here. It made a circle, a letter or something. So I mean, like, I, there ha we have to, there is a way to resolve what happened here. But like, this guy robbed, he said nothing got stolen. It's so fishy. It's so damn fishy. And then when we traced down this story, the newspaper person is like, we had a witness, Garden of Eden. Like, Okay, so here's a theory. This guy, the theory is Colin White is involved in this. The muggers rob him at 6.30. He says nothing was stolen. But what if what they steal is information or a note that leads them to think that they could track, that they could go rob this guy? 
and they do rob him, but he's got nothing because they robbed him before he had a chance to do it. That would make Colin White involved in it, but how would we show that? Perhaps if we could track that woman down. Or track where he says he says he works, but I can't find where he works at. Is that because it's fake? Is that because he really doesn't work where he says he works? We've got a lead. We got a lead about what's happened at that robbery. The newspaper guy says the Garden of Eden. Let's read that again. 30 EC. My reporters found a witness who saw two men acting suspiciously in the area where Colin White was attacked. Apparently one of them had a tattoo. So we were thinking, oh, tattoo, coincidence, but no, maybe not. Tattoo because they were connected with our guy in prison somehow and he tattooed them because he's a tattoo artist but I think what kind of tattoo I'm afraid the investigating reporter is out at the moment but I think he said something about the Garden of Eden Garden of Eden, snake, apple. Like, is this connected? Is this robbery connected? No, but it does. Uh, But the robbers couldn't have been, they obviously didn't know what they had with the finger. That suggests that they're just robbers. They're just random robbers. So like, what does it matter what the tattoo was of? I think it's a, I think it's just a red herring. Nothing was stolen. They beat him up. I mean, there is some backstory to that. I couldn't find anything about that attack, that incident. Right, let's look at our map. I'm going to chase down this lead with this cop who's also was RA, even though we know it has nothing to do with anything. Robert Angel is just leaving his house as we arrive. He is a slim, blonde-haired man with a gaunt face, dressed in his police uniform with his helmet under his arm. He stops when he notices you at the gate. Can I help, he says. We have found your satchel, Mr. Angels. 
Are you trying to sell me that? No, we thought we should return to you. Well, it's not mine. I've never seen it before. Last night, did you finish your shift at 8.30? No, no, I don't see what business it is of yours. I'm the policeman, so I ask the questions. What are you chaps up to? Nothing, sir, sorry. You're right. We were just trying to sell this bag. That's all. We walk off quickly. So, yeah, that was just a little sidetrack thing. Uh, okay, we found our woman. We know she's in, we know she's the mastermind. We don't understand what is going on. Is it possible that Madame Trousseau's wax museum has something to do? Like maybe what was he doing in Regent's Park? We don't know. We tried 97, 98. We don't know. We couldn't find his house. He says he works at a butcher. We can't find any butcher. What's Marleybone Workhouse? All right, I'm going... What is the Marleybone Workhouse? What's a workhouse? Where people work or live where they work? All right, I'm going to check these two places out. I'm going to start at the work workhouse and find out what that is, if it's in here. 45 Northwest. Nope. And 46 Northwest is not in there either. All right. Don't get it. And those would be two more turns against us if we were keeping track, but now we're in negative scores. What was he doing there? All right, let's say he's, he's telling the truth and he his shop and house is there even though he's not in the directory. And he's just handsome and the woman is his wife. And... Nothing was taken totally unrelated to anything and Garden of Eden is totally unrelated. She's tall. She's an actress. Where would she be working? There's a theater. They're all theaters there. What am I going to go to every theater and ask about a tall brunette? How could that be the right thing to do? Bedford's Woman's College, 44. No, there's no 44. All right, we got to stop just randomly. This is like pandemic. We're going to die from running out of cubes. Wow, I wish someone in the chat was... Uh, had a theory here of how to connect what's going on in this case. Whoa, wait a second. <laughs> Newspaper. Todd and Sons Butchers, the finest cuts in London, 4 Longford Street, Northwest. So this is an interesting mechanic where it's not in the directory, but it's in the newspaper. That feels a little bit like cheating, David Neal. Feels a little bit like cheating. Like I like that you have to look it up. Don't like it that it's not in the record. Maybe they're brand new. Okay, they're brand new. That's why they're placing an ad. They're brand new. They haven't made it into the directory yet. Four Longford Street Northwest. Okay. He's on his way to that shop. Boy, let's hope there's something good in here and it's not just someone telling us, oh yeah, he works here. Do you have circled E? Boy, we better have E circled. Yes, we do. At Todd and Son Butchers, we find a large burly man in his 40s with a tattoo on his arm of a snake wrapped around an apple tree. There's our Garden of Evil. Garden of Eden. Whew. I mean, I'm just glad that we tied, that, we, that we're gonna at least understand some of these clues. 
A large burly man in his 40s with a tattoo on his arm of a snake wrapped around an apple tree, who we assume is Todd. Next to him is someone who looks similar, but is in his late teens, who we assume is the son. Excuse me, says Wiggins politely. Does Colin White work here? Todd frowns. He does. Not today, though. We work for the Detective Sherlock Holmes and are investigating the attack on Colin. Never heard of Sherlock What's-His-Face, replies Todd, and we know nothing about what happened. It's just one of those things, that's all. At that moment, the door opens and a dark-haired woman enters who we recognize from Middlesex Hospital. She walks up to Todd and kisses him and then says, Hello, dear. I've just been for tea with Edna. You sure that's where you've been? asked Todd. Yes, of course. Where else? Now I'll get on with doing the books. She walks into a back room. We notice the son's eyes narrow as he hacks into a large leg of beef. Now you lot, Todd says to us. Do you want any meat or what? No, sir, says Wiggins, but thanks for your help. Once outside the shop, he turns to us. Did you notice that Todd and his son both had bruised and scraped knuckles, he whispers? Okay. So we have tied up our little side case, which is that the w Todd and Sons butcher, this new butcher that's not yet in the directory, Colin White works for them. He's having an affair with the wife. The butcher and his son rough him up, beat him up near the park for suspecting, for having or su them suspecting he has an, he's having an affair. They are not the robbers. They are unrelated to our robbery. It's just two men and two men. All right, guys. Time to solve the case. Five hours in. But I'm trying to think. There's an analogy for what just happened that it's come up before, but it's like um, it's like training the rat for the cheese or something. Every once in a while, you spend an extra hour. This is why this is why I spend three hours trying to solve things that can't be solved because like this time we spent an extra hour to try to find this, and we finally did. Look in the newspaper, there was Todd and Sons meet. So we actually got that one paragraph that answered a lot of our mystery questions. So now we'll never give up. Mike, finding this one is going to cause 20 hours of wasted time in the future where I won't admit that something can't be solved because I'll remember this time where persevering paid off. All right, well, our score is going to be negative if we calculate it because of all the time we wasted, but it's time to solve the case. This looks like it has a long solution, too. All right, so let's see. What do we do first? We turn to the back of the book, and we read our questions. Do we need another five-minute break? How about a 60-second break? 60-second break. You are back and you're watching Co-op for Two. 
there's a good chance if you haven't yet, you can press like or subscribe or even support us on Patreon if you want to watch more five hour <laughs> playthroughs. I wonder if you think I'm cheating when I take a 60 second break. I'm not, I'm just sitting here like waiting for the timer to count down. It just seems like it's more suspenseful if there's like a little break before we solve it. Nothing. I'm just sitting here like this for 60 seconds. I took a couple of the purple cubes off. I like did some bookkeeping, but it just felt like, you know, like suspenseful. Like there should be like a pause, a forced pause before we read this whole long solution. I see Rebecca has woken up from her slumber to hear the end. All right, here are our, are our questions. <clears throat> are you ready to solve them? Was there a space where we we're supposed to solve them? Wasn't there like a, I seem to remember there was a, um, there was a book or a place where we answer them. Okay, maybe that was in Mythos Tales. Question one. You wanna see these questions or, or top down or should I read these? I don't know what the, I'm gonna pause and let the audience chime in. Do you wanna see this page or shall I just read it? Here we go. I'm gonna read it with me. Whose finger is it? Okay. So it was the finger of the um, of the of the criminal in jail. His name was Walter something, right? Walter. We wrote it down. Walter Sten or Walter Stern. Two, who cut it off and where and who were they taking it to? So. Um, who cut it off was R A, which was our, what was his name again? It wasn't, there were two RAs, but not the detective. It was Robin Avis, I guess, Robin Avis. And where were they taking it? Well, I guess you could say they were taking it to the cemetery or they could be taking it to that woman who would then go to the cemetery. How did the finger end up in the Thames? We know he was mugged. The robbers ran across the bridge. He was mugged somewhere in there. They ran across the bridge with it. They sat down here to look at what they had gotten. They open up, they see a finger, whoop, off it goes. So uh, robbers, robbers threw it away. What's the significance of the tattoo? Okay, well, there's actually two tattoos. But the tattoo with the Greek letters was to tell us what headstone, to remind him what headstone it was buried in. So those are the first series. Those are the main questions pertaining to our mystery. Those are the ones that really expects you to get the answers to. Now, we had the answer to those long time ago. Now let's see if the second series rewards us for our perseverance. Five, what did the accomplice of the thief originally plan to do and why did the plan change? Okay, that's nice. Well, we know they, she planned to break him out. Break him out of jail. And the plan changed because of the heart attack. Okay. Who were the two muggers? Hmm. Who were the two muggers? Well, now wait. We found out that the people who beat up Colin White in the park were the butcher and his son. And then my conclusion was that Two other random muggers robbed the other guy. But are we to assume that either we didn't find out who the two muggers of our guy were or that they're the same two? Well, um, 
And then the next question, seven, is who attacked Colin White and why was he attacked? So we are being rewarded for solving that second mystery. So who attacked Colin White was Todd and Son. And why um, it was jealousy over the wife. But I guess that means that we don't know who the two, the question six, who were the two muggers who actually robbed our guy. Is that right? And no question about Claire Poole? It's kind of odd, huh? Question six is who are the two muggers? Question seven, who attacked Colin White? Question eight, why was Colin White attacked? We've got seven and eight right. They work up here. So two other muggers robbed our guy and we don't know who they are. Unless they're Todd and Son, unless the answer to six and seven are both Todd and Son. I mean, if we had the guess, we'd say Todd and Son because we don't know anyone else. Um, but that is odd. I don't remember any clues leading us to other muggers. Do you? I wonder if we should have pursued the leads around where that happened, right? It was like he was robbed near the Spanish embassy. And then they came through here. I wonder if we had tracked down some of those leads, whether someone would know who they were. All right, well, I'm going to put Todd and Son but I don't think they're the same. I think they just beat him up. They're not, ro they're not robbers. They, they work at the... I guess we don't know who the muggers were. Any idea in the comments of something we missed? We didn't even... Um, we didn't even pursue it. Like, we didn't even... Once we realized that they robbed him for no reason, we just thought they were random robbers that were totally not important for us to get. Um, I mean, it's clearly not important for our personal satisfaction that we, come, that we find who these um, robbers are. Do you think it might have to do with one of these other cases about vandalism? Bloomsbury Way we found was over here somewhere, or here somewhere. I'm just looking at this newspaper case again. The elder's daughter, I don't see anything. Yeah, I don't see, I don't, whatever it was, we didn't, maybe we could have pursued it if we had traced the route that they stole it, but I'm okay with not solving that. Um, I'm glad that there were questions about Colin that we figured out. So, now, what, uh, I'm trying to remember, like, we've got the questions, we've got the answers, and then we've got Holmes' solution. I guess we're supposed to read the answers first to our questions and our scoring. So, um... Whose finger is it? Walter Stern, that's plus 25. Um, who cut it off is Robin Avies. We got that right, that's plus 10. He was taking it to Claire Poole. We got that right. Right. Oh, that was our... What did I write down? R-A... 
Yeah, I mean, we knew he was taking it to Claire Paul, so that's plus 15. Okay, three. How did the finger end up in the Thames? Robin was mugged and his bag was stolen. The, rob the muggers found the finger and threw it in the Thames, plus 25. So we got all those 100% correct. That tattoo indicates the grave that the Greek Orthodox section of the South Metropolitan Center, where the pearl is hidden. Four. We got that right, too. Why is that? Oh, this is all part of four. The letters were memorized by Walter Stern, and while in prison, he tattooed onto his finger so he would never forget where the pearl was. That's plus 25. If you understand, if you understood that it was indeed Zoe Zenos's grave, get another 15 points. So we got perfect score there. Second series. Okay. Um, what was the, what did they originally, what did the accomplice originally plan to do? Break him out of prison. So we got that right. That's plus 15. And he died of a heart attack, right? We got that right. Okay. Who were the muggers? Tall Ben and Cheeky Tom. We had no idea who those two were. I'm not, it was weird that the underworld guy didn't know, or maybe we were just going through it so quickly. He gave us a clue and we didn't. But, um, if we had, possibly if we had followed it, followed those things, we might have found that out. Who attacked Colin, the, Todd the Butcher, and his son? That's plus 15 points. And why Todd suspected Colin was having an affair with his wife? Plus 15 points. Okay, so 25, 35, 40, 50, 75, 80, 90. 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 points for set one. And then 45 for set two, 135. So we got 135 out of a total of 150. So about as wonderful as you could do, except if you then subtract all the points for all the things we did. Three, four, five, 10, 15, 20, 25, we probably lose 125 or more points. Probably lose all of those points. I think they're supposed to be five points each. So depending on how you looked at it, we either did amazingly well, missed only the one thing, or we got a score of zero. That's fine. We're, we're completely happy with that. I wish we had... We'll talk about that in a second. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the one question we got wrong when we review this case at the end. But first, we must take a deep breath and read Sherlock Holmes, rub it in our face how quickly he could have solved this. Solution. Look at this, it's three pages long. <clears throat> Inspectors Lestrade and Wadlow of Scotland Yard study the finger with a mix of fascination and horror. You say this is Walter Scott's, Walter Stern's finger, asks Wadwell. Yes, Holmes replies. And one of your er, irregulars, irregulars found it in the river? Yes, Tinker found it. Tinker grins and waves at Wadlow. Holmes, cries Lestrade. <coughs> Stern is dead, so we don't give a damn what's happened to his finger. Why have you summoned two of the yard's finest detectives to Baker Street? How did the finger end up in the Thames? mutters Wadlow. Wadlow! shouts Lestrade, infuriated. Enough of the irrelevant questions. It's not an irrelevant question, says Holmes. At the starting point for this investigation was St. Thomas Hospital on the bank of the Thames, where the finger was found. A nurse had seen two men on the wall by the river just before 9.30 p.m. last night, rifling through a bag in haste. They kept looking back towards Westminster Bridge, and then after five minutes, they ran off. What does this suggest? That the men had taken the bag from someone, says Wadlow, who was pursuing them. Indeed, responds Holm, full marks to Inspector Wadlow, which means the thieves were not looking for the finger, but were horrified to find it and discarded it. The next step was to visit was a visit to Shifty, who had found a satchel near the tin containing the finger. The satchel could tell us more about the person who originally was carrying it. The satchel bore the initials R.A. and contained a sheet of paper, which, although water damaged, appeared to be a patrol schedule for the 16th June, listing areas identified by compass directions north, northeast, southeast, and each allocated a 30-minute slot. 
So we can conclude that the person who had the finger probably did patrol work, and they may have had the initials R.A. Perhaps a policeman, says Watson, patrolling the city. If he could patrol North London in half an hour, Watson, he is certainly faster than you or I. <laughs> and even on a horseback, I'd be surprised if he had any time to look for signs of criminal activity. The fact that each section takes only half an hour to patrol indicates parts of a building or a state, not a city. And the compass directions are suggestive, are they not? Everyone looks at Holmes in bafflement, then he continues. But before visiting this individual's supposed place of work, a trip to see Porky Shinwell seemed wise, given that a petty street crime was central to this mystery. Porky said a woman had been seen in the Raven and Rat at midday, trying to find two men who mugged someone outside the Spanish embassy at 9 p.m. last night. Aha! Could these be the two men who were sitting on the bank of the Thames before 9.30? It seemed likely. As it would take the muggers approximately 30 minutes to get from the embassy to outside St. Thomas Hospital. This woman might have been keen to find the muggers because she wanted to retrieve the bag and its contents. Porky's customer, Isabel, said the woman lived between Belgrave Square and Buckingham Palace Gardens. That's down here. There is only one location matching that description, and it is not far from the Spanish Embassy. While no one was at home at the address, and some letters to Claire Poole were visible on the sideboard, along with a note reading, Plan is off, he is dead, or death. The occluded letters might well be A.D., and if so, the individual in question could be the one whose finger was being carried. Now we will again consider where the mugging victim's place of work could be. The patrol schedule says he or she finished work at 8.30 p.m., says Wiggins, and the mugging happened outside the Spanish embassy at about 9 p.m. Excellent, says Holmes, which means we are looking for someone where somewhere where people work in shifts that is 30 minutes walk from the Spanish embassy. Millbank, mutters Inspector Wadlow, where Stern was an inmate. Precisely, Inspector Holmes responds, and Millbank also fits with the areas listed on the patrol schedule. You can see from the map that the prison is divided into six wings, which correspond to the compass directions north, northeast, southeast, south, and southwest, and northwest. Uh, there are no east or west wings. Brilliant, says Wadlow. At Millbank, Officer Huber confirmed that one of the prison guards had the initials R.A., Robin Aves. Huber said Walter Stern's finger had been taken and revealed that you, Inspector Wadlow, were the policeman who arrested Stern in 84. Stern's cellmate, Cedric Tallow, remembered Stern tattooing his finger. He did so because he had a friend who needed reassurance that he would not forget something important. Stern wrote and told this person what he had done, and they were reassured. Now, of course, all the pieces come together. Wadlow nods. You came to talk to me next, he says, to find out what happened when Stern was arrested. I told you that he stole the Arabelli pearl and it was never found. Are you saying he managed to conceal it somewhere and that is what he needed to remember, the hiding place? Full marks again to Inspector Wadlow, says Holmes. He really should try to keep up with Strad. <laughs> Stern did not go far before he was caught, but he did run through the South Metropolitan Cemetery. Could the tattoo refer to a location within the cemetery? With this notion in mind, a visit to the Stanbridge Foundation for the Care of London Cemeteries was most instructive. Miss Stanbridge revealed that in 1842, a section of the cemetery was allocated for use by the Greek Orthodox community. So the tattoo refers to the Greek section of the cemetery, says Wadwell. We can be more precise than that, says Holmes. Let us imagine how the events occurred. On the day of the burglary, Walter Stern realized he would be caught, so he clumsily hid most of the jewelry under a rock, intending it to be found. That way, the police would think that the Arabelli pearl was simply lost, when in fact Stern had hidden it elsewhere. Running through the cemetery, he realized he was surrounded by consecrated ground that would lay undisturbed for centuries. Anything he concealed here would remain undiscovered until he was able to return. He took the Arabelli pearl and pushed it into the ground at the base of a gravestone or dropped it into an open sepulchre. Whatever it was, whichever it was, when he looked at the epitaph, he saw the text was in Greek, as was the text on all the stones around him. He looked to the words on the stone and memorized as many letters as he could and then continued to run. 
From prison, he wrote to Claire Poole, the accomplice who helped him plan his robberies, to tell her he had hidden the pearl, and if she could break him out, they could be rich. She was concerned he would forget where he had hidden it, and to reassure, he, reassure her, he told her he had tattooed a reminder on his finger. Poole began to plan Stern's breakout and recruited the assistance of prison guard Robin Aves. But before any plan could be put into effect, Stern died of a heart attack. Poole told Aves to cut, cut off Stern's tattooed finger and bring it to her. She probably had no idea what was tattooed on the finger, and knowing Aves to be largely illiterate, did not trust him to copy it correctly. She also knew this could be their only chance, as the body would be cremated. Aves obtained the finger, but on his way from Millbank to Poole's house, he was mugged. His muggers found the finger and threw it into the Thames. So, says Lestrade, we just need to fig find the grave with the letters on, and we find the Arabelli pearl. Yes, replies Holmes. I imagine Stern will have picked out the largest letters, which will be the name of the deceased. So look to those first. And we need to arrest Claire Poole and Robin Ave, says Wadwell. But Lestrade is already hurrying from the room. <laughs> At the door, Wadwell turns back to us. Thank you, he says. After all this time, I never thought I would find Stern's accomplice or recover the Arabelli pearl. Well, Inspector, says Tinker with a wink, it's amazing what turns up on the banks of the Thames. If you ever want to come mudlarking, you'd be more than welcome. The Inspector smiles uncertainly. From downstairs, Lestrade shouts, Wadlow! Wadlow shrugs and follows his colleague onto the street outside. Okay, now we've got a little summary. Which, which six clues Holmes would have needed to solve the entire case? He went to the hospital, then he went to Shifty, then he went to Porky, then he went to Millbank Prison, then he went to Claire Poole at 56 South W. Right? We went there too. He went to her house. She wasn't there. Then he went to Scotland Yard. Then he went to the Stanbridge Foundation. And then he went to Miss Yabley and, and Lomax or Free Lee doing a clue. How did he find the names of the two robbers? They're not in those clues, are they? Let's just look at Shinwell quickly to see, because he's like the guy who knows the underground stuff, 52 EC. Let's just make sure he didn't tell us their names. If he did, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to count that as us. Knowing. Um, anyone cutting off fingers? Short lady in a coat. He's trying to find the two people responsible. He, he says, I have no idea who they were. Holmes didn't. I don't know how Holmes knows who those two people are. Obviously, there's, there's clues in there somewhere. Probably if you track down their route. Maybe they like, like, I'll bet if we track down their route, well, they have to go here, right? But um, maybe they went to a pub afterwards or went to the station. Okay, but uh, Sherlock Holmes, the way he came to the solution, didn't seem like he bothered with trying to find the names of those muggers. So I don't think we should feel so bad. All right. So we did a little bit better in that case as far as fine figuring everything out. Although we did miss, I mean, it's good. That, it's nice that it's nice to miss a little bit. You don't feel like, you know, it's nice to feel like, well, if you'd put in more work, you, you would have gotten more reward, but just that one thing. And I, I'm thrilled that that last, that last hour we spent trying to figure out what was going on with Colin White uh, was rewarded with those secondary questions. Um, all right, so let's talk about the case, and maybe we'll start at that Colin White thing for a second and talk a little bit about how difficult it is when you're designing these cases, having played a bunch of them. From a design perspective, you have to, the designer had to communicate somehow to us that this was a solvable thing, not just a red herring. Because 
you have to, these cases have to be filled with red herrings, but there has to be some sort of getting on the same wavelength with the player to tell them you should keep trying to figure this out. It's not something that you can write off as insignificant. And part of that's the skill of the designer and part of that's uh, the player using some intuition and experience to, to, to sort out which things need to be resolved and which things don't. And uh, for most of that case, most of this case that worked, it failed us. You could see a good example where it failed us with, with those muggers names. Now, part of the problem is the game doesn't want to tell you, hey, when you get to the end, you're going to need to know this information. Now, that's an interesting question. Like, why don't these games say, here are the six questions you're going to get at the end. When you figure those out, then you can click it. It's very difficult to not know what the questions are because you're, you only get one shot at it and, and you're, you sort of feel like you better keep looking in case you get asked about anything. Like, is this case going to ask us about those two husband and wife suicide? Is it going to ask us about those vandalism? You don't know. And so should you go hunting for five days and just try to find everything? So there's kind of an implicit little bargaining going on with giving information to give you clues about which case, which pieces you should find answers to. And part of that is experience as a player. And we did well, and the designer did well, in giving us enough hints to tell us that we should wrap up that Colin White mystery. But it might have been nice if it gave us a little bit of hints about those muggers that it, w it was going to ask us who their names were. I think you can make a logical case that they are irrelevant. They are the most bit of the bit players in this whole thing. And knowing whose names they are, knowing who mugged and threw away, they're, they're just not, they're not that important. So it might have been nice to have an extra little clue of that, but um, on the other hand, you could say, well, when there's a crime, you should try to track down that path of those criminals and always see if you could find a witness to them. There were some other great things that happened in this case. First of all, lots of use of this, um, this evidence stuff. Very fun. Uh, unlike the first case, this was a case where we sort of got ahead of it at some point and got to some places that we didn't have the evidence to pursue and then came circled back. Really fun, really nice and satisfying. Like it gives you a little bit of um, anticipation. You're like circle N. You're like, oh, I can't wait to see what that does. I can't wait to see what that leads to. So that was great. Then there was a very, very clever little, just a little thing here. We knocked on this guy's house. We had this nice interaction with him where he's like, yeah, give me my satchel. Then he chased us. We hid in this place. He stayed outside to watch for us come out. We went out the back and went back to his house, which was now vacant. So very cool, very fun all wrapped up in one little piece. We didn't have to remember it and come back. And it does raise a larger issue that I think is worth uh, discussing with this Sherlock Holmes consulting detective game. And it has to do with sort of this old technology in terms of looking up paragraphs in a book. And you can see both with the evidence and with this thing where it says, you know, go here, then you can read it if you do V. And, you know, in a, in a modern game like Chronicles of Crime, it's all handled in an app and an app would do that sort of automatically for you. And it would make it more challenging because in this one, as soon as we read his paragraph, it said, if you have V, skip to here. And then when he chased us, it gave us V. So it was obvious to us that we should go back. 
And it raises a really interesting issue about what is the value and what is the cost of playing a game with this old paper and lookup technology? Wouldn't this be better done with an app? You wouldn't have to spend your time looking. You wouldn't have the risk of reading paragraphs ahead of time or noticing that certain things are there. And it's a good question. I mean, on paper, pun intended, um, everything is would be improved by using an app except the sort of physical experience or purposeful going back to a more primitive time of doing things on paper or appreciating the constraints of working within a, this system. Chronicles of Crime shows that you can do some very sophisticated stuff if you use an app. And this is more like, well, let's let's try the old fashioned way of the old fashioned game and see if we can appreciate the constraints of this. And it's charming. It's charming to work in this old system. I wouldn't say that I can't, I mean, you know, mo the, a modern app would allow you to make it more challenging, give out less, inf leak less information. Um, but there's something charming about doing it all on paper without an app, without a tablet. And it's, it's fitting if you're back in the 1800s that you're, you're feeling like you're working with this technology, these paragraphs that feel sort of dated, but also minimalistic. And, you know, it's like a meditative thing that you're dealing with these within this system of just reading paragraphs and this sort of old time mechanical system of finding evidence. Um, full travel around London. That was very fun. The story was great. Again, I mean, Dave Neal is doing his, he's, he's hitting it out of the park with his writing and his theme and his atmosphere and flavor. Really, I feel like I'm back in the 1800s talking to these characters and these kids, um, very satisfying. I love how, again, we sort of started out with very few clues, right? We had almost nothing. And we sort of unpaced the pace of discovering new suspects and new stuff came out and we got little hints. And it's very rewarding in these games to be like, you uncover something you're like, well, it could be this or it could be this. And then as you go further, one of them gets weeded out, right? Like, did they kill him or did he die natural causes? And it's very satisfying that those sort of all got resolved, right? Like, did he die of natural causes? Yes. And then that was emphasized by the fact that there was an initial plan and then the plan changed. Like all these tiny little pieces eventually narrowed us down from a very wide set of possibilities, narrowed us down. There were some cool things about the tailor um, fi figuring out that it was happening, that it was a guard when we looked at that note. And um, that brings another mechanical point that we should talk about because it's an issue that Greg and I disagree about and you saw it at work here where part of the way these games work is that if you spend five hours, well, six hours we've spent, if you spend five hours, you're going to find that there are things you figured out early that later get super confirmed, right? Like we, figure, we figured out the basic gist of what was happening way ahead of the curve. It was, it was very satisfying to suspect that this is what happened and that he was mugged and the criminal didn't know what they had, etc. So we figured that out way before we got hard confirmation of it. And then the game, as we tracked down all the leads, did give us hard confirmation. Now, you might look at that and say, when you get that hard confirmation, when you follow these different leads, you might say, oh, that's, 
That's disappointing. I would have figured, I already figured that out, right? And now you've given me the answer when I figured it out early and you feel like, oh, you know, like it's making me feel like I didn't earn the answer because you've, you've given it to me now. I didn't have to figure it out. But I think that's the wrong way to play these games. And I think as a designer, you have to, you have to provide more confirmation the further down they go because some people aren't going to put those, uh, connect those dots or miss certain things. So the way I approach these games is that the, the, the satisfaction has to come from figuring it out early and having good hypotheses early. And then it's okay if the game, you know, really locks it down and confirms it as you play. The satisfaction is that you, you narrowed it down earlier than the game did for you. And you kept open those possibilities and you hypothesized these things might have been true before the game. And you know in your heart, you didn't have to, you didn't need all those extra steps. Um, there were a couple times now in this game, now in the first case we played, I don't remember very few places we went to that we thought should have something to read didn't. This one had quite a few. There were a bunch of places in Regent's Park that felt like there should be a paragraph there. There should be a short sentence there that's just like, oh, you found the scene of the crime or there's nothing there. Especially now when we found the mastermind of the whole thing, Claire Poole, then we looked her up and we figured out she was the tailor and maybe that was why her coat was there. And then when we went to her tailor shop, there was nothing there. That was a disappointment, Dave Neal. Like, there could be just a little thing there. It wouldn't even have to, wouldn't even have to be, it would be nice to confront her, but just a little thing about the shop being closed or whatever. That was a tiny disappointment. Now, I will say this. This is another example where technology partly solves that. It's hard to play test all these things and get everything. If you look at um, Chronicles of Crime, they push little silent updates constantly on the app. You don't even notice it, but you'll be, you'll have a scenario, you download scenario and you'll check the app and like maybe once a month, they'll have pushed a new update to a scenario. And the scenario was solvable and playable beforehand, but it's basically what they're doing is they're getting reports from people about things that were confusing or misleading or adding extra little dialogue, like when you show this person this thing, and they're updating it constantly. And you could see if you had an app and all of this, what's in this book could put, be put in an app. It's a very simple app. Um, you could see where you wouldn't have to, you could release a game. I mean, imagine the testing and the release of this has to go on and then then the masses start testing it and you realize, oh, we should have added this. We could have added that, but you can't, it's already printed. So an app would solve that, but you know, it might be nice. You could also, it's not really errata, but you could imagine a fan uh, supplements to the Sherlock Holmes game that are just like additional location dialogue, not central to the case, but like where maybe either with an app or with extra printout paper that said like, you know, if you don't find a location in the normal case book, here's some fan added paragraphs that fill in some of these locations. So if most people were tracking down Claire, you could just have a little fan flavor paragraph that you could read and that by, might be a nice thing for people to, um, that would be a thing that a fan could do, could write extra par flavor paragraphs for extra places you could go. I love the reward for, for following down the Colin White. I mean, I love that like we were really frustrated. We did not know what to, how to figure out what happened to him. 
We were given enough clues to know that we should. The tattoo, we went to the newspaper, our Garden of Eden, and we caught David Neal trying to do the newspaper trick on us again, which is what happened to us first case. We missed something in the newspaper. And then right at the end, we noticed in the personal section, was it the person? No, it was miscellaneous section. Right here, down at the bottom. Right here, down at the bottom. It says, Todd and Son Butchers, the finest cuts in London for Longford Street, which is where our guy, when we went to him at the hospital, he said, I'm, I was walking through the park on the way between my house and Todd and Son's. We couldn't find his house. He wasn't in the directory, and Todd and Sons Butcher was not in the directory, at least not that we could find. It's not under Todd and Sons, and I couldn't find it in the markets. So it's tough. Like, are we mad at Dave Neal for not putting them in the directory? and trying to sneak them only in the newspaper. Now I rationalize that by saying it's a new shop, didn't make it into the directory. But what, what would be the fix for that? If, if Dave is gonna tell us, if Dave Neal is gonna tell us that that is a way to rationalize it, then what is missing? What's missing is that that miscellaneous newspaper article or item shouldn't say Todd and Sons butchers the finest cuts in London. It should say announcement opening a new butcher shop, Todd and Sons. Then it would feel like, oh, okay, it's an announcement of the new shop. That's why it's in the newspaper and not in the directory. So we will just, in our minds, edit that in as if it said that. Love the case though. Can't wait to play case three. As we wind down and say goodbye, I'll look at the comments. Now is your chance. If you have any, what does the audience think? Those who stuck with it, think about the case. Any any final thoughts about um, the case? What did you guys think from an audience perspective? I'm not sure you guys were paying, all of you paid all attention all the time. That was a rough moment at the end though when we couldn't track, track down Colin White. That was getting frustrating. Like I was that close to just saying, all right, let's just try to solve it without it. But I didn't want to get tricked with that newspaper. And he almost got us. He almost got it. All right. So that was it. That was case two. And we're going to play the other eight cases. And the last five are all connected. Those are going to be really challenging. But wow, case two was great. Okay, guys, we will see you next next week for another live stream. But between then and uh, now and then, you'll also see videos with, uh, with me and Greg. And I forget what's coming this week. Soon Detective City of Angels has come up and we just posted a pretty critical negative review of Dead Men Tell No Tales. But, um, okay, we will see you next time. I'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us. And uh, remember, click like, subscribe, and support us on Patreon. See ya. Oh, I came up with a better way to do this. Okay, see you next time.